push the recording. <clears throat> Got to have morning coffee. You know, we're in Melbourne, the coffee capital of the world. So it's critical we have our coffees. Afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw right, the best Sunday video. Where you are. <laughs> I, I just saw the best TikTok video ever. It was somebody gluing a tea bag paper thing <laughs> over the side of their coffee cup and then turning to the side, filling the cup with red wine, and yeah. then saying, Every Zoom call ever in quarantine. <laughs> I was like, that's what's in that cup? You don't know, see. <laughs> Show us your love. It. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but that was pretty great. <laughs> Okay, now I think we're going to be live on Facebook. I'm just going to confirm and I'll share this on my, it my says own. says webinar is now streaming live on Facebook. Yeah, okay. Oh, cool. yeah. I'm just going to share on my pages as well. If you want to do so just quickly, feel free. Righto, so I'll close that down. Come back in here. Alrighty, beautiful. So what else was there? attendees well oh, no, fantastic so we've got the full house looks good having uh all, all of us all in line this is fantastic guys and thank you very much for uh attending for those that aren't aware i'm dan hindry the founder of uh, unified purpose and uh, a couple of weeks ago and a month before that we had a couple of other interviews which um are definitely focused on as you'll find the, the models we're rolling out within our business and the changes that are required in business, the way we live and the way that we're going to develop the technologies moving forward. So we've got a quite a broad, um, broad uh, spectrum of expertise within this interview and this discussion. So basically, um, thank you, first of all, to all the experts that have joined us today. I'm really looking forward to the input um, that you have in regards to those topics of how we can you know, build sustainable businesses and the way we need to live moving forward and develop technologies to benefit, you know, humanity, do things the right way. Um, so before we get into it, I'll introduce sort of in an order that we're going to be uh, going through the introduction ourselves. I think uh, all the experts that are attending this first time round, we're just doing that quick little introduction. So everyone's got a, a feel for who you are and how it all fits in. And then we'll go into more detail on, on your time lot. We'll probably keep it to about 10 minutes each uh, when you have your have the microphone. And um, if there's any other experts that want to chime in and sort of co-host with me, any questions that you have that you feel will add value after understanding from that intro and the research we've done, that would be fantastic. Um, so in the order, basically, we'll do the whole flow of this conversation. We'll uh, I'll start set a bit of a backstory of why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I brought you all together. Probably some of you might have a bit of an idea. You might be wondering why. <laughs> and uh, from there, we'll go Kent. Uh, we actually have one missing, which is Raphael. I'll text him as we go through the introductions and we'll, we'll just slot him in. He might have had the wrong link, uh, potentially. And yeah, so we'll go uh, Kent, Raphael, uh, Stephen Ferruccio uh, from ShareTree, over to Mayor Zuckerman from The Man, uh, Robert Palmer, uh, from Zero Point Distribution, Jim Gale from Food Forest Abundance, Rob Sharon from Blue IoT, uh, Sam Yang uh, from the CSIRO here in Australia, and Michael McElliott uh, from um, Smart Green Group. So, didn't miss anyone there, did I? No? Beautiful. So, as we get stuck into it, I'll just, uh, over to you, Kent, in a second. As we're doing that, I'll just switch it into speaker view and I'll get on to Raphael, hopefully he can jump on quickly. So, uh, yeah, Ken, if you can use that quick brief format and we'll go around in that, in that order, guys. As, as I try to remember what the quick, quick brief format was, uh, uh, my, name is, <laughs> my name is Kent Langley. I'm currently sitting in San Rafael, California, which is just north of San Francisco and in between San Francisco and California wine country, the North Bay. It's uh, amazing, amazing and beautiful here today. Uh, one of the questions from the format was, I think it was what I like about the, my business. Is that right, Dan? Uh, yeah. Uh, am I getting that right? Okay. So what, the thing about my business is that it, um, it has evolved a lot over the years and the most amazing thing is I get to do a whole lot of everything and I 
personally really love that. So you'll find in any given day that I'm working on artificial intelligence, uh, big data, data analytics, data operations in particular as my specialty within AI, uh, innovation uh, as a co-founder of OpenEXO, uh, we're creating community and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, and then uh, just getting to spend a lot of time founding my own companies as well as advising some incredibly interesting companies. So that's my business, uh, sort of in a, in, a, in, a, in a scattershot way, but uh, it, it, it really works out every skill that I've ever had time to develop. And uh, I couldn't uh, ask for anything more than that. Love it. To learn every day. So we'll, um, we'll skip Raphael, he might come in, we'll just go back, but over to you, Steve. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for actually bringing us all together, first of all. I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm Stephen Farigia. I'm the founder of ShareTree. I've actually uh, had 12 startups now. So we've got a model for social entrepreneur startups where we've had 68% success rate, where global average is down around four. So we're doing something right, and we'll share a bit of that later on. Uh, what I love and passionate about is empowering people through character. Uh, and we're passionate about creating a shift globally where people that are highly regarded are regarded for their character strengths and not to their wealth accumulation. Um, so the best thing about our charity, I run a charity organization uh, where charity as a service, so Robin Hood model. So we don't steal from the rich, we provide them a service, but we take those profits and we feed that back from the corporate sector to schools and community orgs. So we educate in character across all three of those sectors, including parents from schools, uh, we engage team cultures, um, and the greatest thing about engaging team cultures is that uh, while we're tackling mental health and well-being issues, we're actually rising team performance so that they're, they're more profitable. And this is why a lot of corporates are taking on our technology. And the last part is empowering people by aligning their purpose to UN sustainable goals so they can contribute back to the community in a way that we all advance by strategy and technology. Great right, stuff, mate. Beautiful. We'll go more into detail and uh, with Maya. I've done yeah. this in an order, as you can probably tell, guys, that it all flows from, you know, what I understand of yourself, Maya, and what Steve, and what we're all doing. So over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Maya Zuckerman. Uh, I live in San Francisco, California. Um, I, and I love working with solutionists and regenerative leaders to solve our most pressing challenges on the planet. My main focus is I'm working as COO of a group called Lumen.io, the strategy firm that strives to innovate while creating the future. Uh, we support large organizations and leaders to have their lights on and to move forward during these times. Um, I'm also an operational advisor for Regenibus, which is a multi-platform approach for uh, basically aligning the SDGs with the cannabis and hemp industry and supporting them in building more regenerative business uh, models and, and companies. Uh, and I'm also a EXO coach and consultant. So love seeing Kent here. Um, and I've, I'm advising on uh, numerous other, um, other projects all towards a more green and just and equitable future. Um, and the last thing, and that's why I always have a background like this is I'm a pre-published sci-fi writer. And I wanna look at what is possible for us if we actually get our act together as humans and create a future that actually works for all beings in the shortest amount of time. Love it, Maya. Good work. Now, just quickly, Raphael, who's pretty much off the grid with what he does, has had a storm, so he won't be attending. So just so everyone's aware. Uh, obviously, from Maya, over to you, Robert Palmer. There's a great connection there. So please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so my name is Robert Palma. Uh, I'm based here in Los Angeles, California. I'm a mechanical engineer and my company is Zero Point Distribution and we focus on supply chain management specifically to the hemp industry uh, because it's uh, versatile uses. Um, today they have estimated about 65,000 products can be made for hemp, uh, which is very uh, interesting and amazing for us for the, for the planet and the economy. Uh, I personally love uh, doing business and starting businesses. And the best thing about my business is that I'm able to help a lot of people in doing so. Um, a lot of people here in Los Angeles that are looking for opportunities uh, to be more sustainable, but there's not really uh, access to funding and making that happen. So I'm really grateful to share. Um, I created a proposal called California 4.0, which is about basically building a hemp supply chain here in California. It's going to create a lot of jobs and opportunities for people. Um, I'll speak more about it obviously later. And uh, I'm part of this mastermind because I love sustainable living and sustainable development. It's been a Keep a key point in my life since uh, 2018 when I first learned about it 
and I've been uh, working towards it ever since. Yeah, I've seen you hustling online, man, and all your videos. So I keep doing what you're doing. So thanks for the intro. Um, yeah. And obviously, it's a good little flow into yourself, Jim Gale. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Dan, for setting this up. It's an honor to meet uh, future or, or current ecopreneurs, as I like to call myself. Um, so I started in Costa Rica, planted thousands of fruit trees and edible landscapes everywhere in a couple communities. I learned how easy it is to be sustainable. Uh, Bill Mollison was right when he said the problems of the world are increasingly complex, but the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. Food for us everywhere. So my company helps anybody, any corporation, any church, any individual resident create food in their yard using perennials that are actually less maintenance in a lot of cases than a lawn. And I was going to say an American lawn, but this isn't necessarily an American only group. Um, you've got lawns there too, right? Lawns are the most destructive monocrop on the planet. They do not produce a yield. They are only an expense. And sure, they might look beautiful, but if we turn half our lawns into food production systems, there'd be food everywhere for free. That's, I've scaled it, we've done the franchise model, um, got the history for it, and we're going to social media. We've got 500 new clicks in the, or signups in the last two days. We're going to go nuts with this thing, and we're going to scale it globally, um, or we're going to help other people that are doing it as well. Love it, Jim. Thank you very much, Thanks. man. We'll go further into that, and I'll be interested, and we'll talk about it. We'll ask the question. I'll ask in, in questions in between to connect some of the dots that I see as well, guys. But, um, you know, with Robert Sharon, with uh, making that, Easy, I suppose, to have smart agriculture with IIT. He's going to introduce Blue IIT, Bob. Thanks, Dan. Uh, g'day, everybody. Um, I'm the founder and CEO and Chief Innovation Officer and Chief Bottle Washer for <laughs> uh, Blue IoT. Um, and the IoT Internet of Things, I think everyone gets. The blue is the blue economy. And uh, the blue economy for us, the definition I use is what does it take to build something, whether it's a farm, a building, a city, a place. What does it take to maintain it? What effect does it have on the people using it? And what effect does it have on the planet? So it's a 360 degree approach. And so for us, it's about supporting the blue economy in smart cities, smart buildings and places. And we leverage the internet of things as an enabler, not a widget. Some people love to sell this, this, this widget and you know, here's this shiny thing. But the shiny thing is nothing, it's useless. What does it do? So what we've developed is the world's first virtual building management, um, energy management platform in the world. So uh, think of Siemens, Schneider, Honeywell, uh, and all these guys, and they put in their building automation systems and they're all proprietary. They're all closed systems, they're all wired. Uh, anytime you wanna change, they, they gotcha up here. Um, and everything you want to connect to is a pain. Well, with us, it's all open platform. It's all cloud-based. Even our controllers are wireless on a global standard radio network, non-IP network for cybersecurity. And so, therefore, we can manage, control things from the cloud, do alarms, do the dashboards. Uh, it's all data-driven. So, our analytics platform in the cloud, leveraging machine learning, and we'll be building AI into this to optimize buildings, places, cities, agriculture, farms. Um, and in our early case studies, we've achieved up to 50% reduction. In fact, 60% reduction of utility bills through our platform. So we are really optimizing and reducing energy in our carbon footprint and also maintenance, unplanned maintenance. Um, so it's really a game changer, it's disruptive. We've already got channel partners uh, in the US, we're looking for more and around the globe. So we expect to be expanding, especially post COVID-19, this thing uh, is really gonna explode because it's gonna support the planet uh, and everybody wins along the way. That's what's so good about this stuff. Love it, Bob, love it. And uh, hopefully you're enjoying the proximity and the introduction of why you're part of this, mate. Absolutely, love it. Love, love what everybody's doing. It's all, it's all connected. I mean, even I've read about this, like even from five years ago, hemp in concrete, for example, yeah. I'm aware that it, it in fact strengthens the concrete. It, yeah. it also helps. Um, well, we'll, what we'll do, Bob, is we'll, we'll uh, talk about that towards the end, because if anyone's listening and for attendees here, there's a couple that will be part, including yourself with the next interview. 
which is focused on smart building cities and property development. So what we'll do is we'll keep the intro rolling on and Michael McElliott is at the tail end of this, last but not least, but it's mainly to, with the you two guys to talk about stuff like that with the hint for the, leading into the next interview, but relative to this. So Michael McElliott, over to yourself. Hi right, guys, uh, my name's Michael McElliott. So I'm uh, founder of Smart Green Group. We're focused on sustainable urban development and also the C uh, the managing director of uh, Green Node Builders at um, more on sustainable suburban development for um, mum and dad investors and and, and uh, creating value in, in the sustainable market on both sides of a city's uh, landscape and infrastructure. So uh, happy to be here, happy to be at the event. Fantastic, Mike. Thank you very much, mate. So, rolling on from here, look, I'll um, basically introduce myself as well. I, um, you know, I'm here to basically help a lot of entrepreneurs that um, need that journey to be easier. You know, as as we transition with a lot of different changes happening in business and the way that we live and and operate, and I think collaborate. And yeah, I'm part of this. I'm hosting this to basically uh, fulfill and feed a model which I think any entrepreneur and business needs to go down in this format of sort of the mastermind type formula where there's a collective here coming together to, you know, achieve our individual goals and uh, our, our collective goals. So that's why I'm here. So uh, basically I wanted to summarise and go a little bit deeper into that and just tell a little bit of a backstory as well to why uh, things have come together here and I'm just going to go to gallery mode as I explain all this. Um, yeah, so look, basically for those that aren't aware, I've been an entrepreneur pretty much my whole working life and uh, had some experience in business where one particularly as a public investment or fintech company uh, didn't end up that good. Uh, ended up failing and went through the capital raising process and you know, which is quite a difficult and costly process and then dealing with staff and growth of a business can be very difficult. So the view when I say about sustainable business and leading past that, uh, what actually occurred in my life when I was looking for answers was focused and I saw what was happening with technologies. Um, particularly the example that I had was focused on uh, an art DAO, which to explain that simple is just the way that, you know, business is going to move forward in an e-commerce environment where there was generative artificial intelligence combined with blockchain to manage designs. And then you had 3D printed jewelry. And I saw that in amongst other things that were happening with technology. And I thought, wow, I've got two kids for those that aren't aware that are going to grow up in a world that's going to be completely different to the way I grew up riding around in the push bike and things being much simpler. Um, so, Having an understanding of that and then throughout going down this rabbit hole, seeing what was happening with conversations with universal basic income, which has popped up a lot more recently with what's happened with COVID-19. And, you know, it's a huge reality and sort of that it's here now, which, you know, speeding, speeding my ambitions and goals up, I can tell you right now, because the thing that concerns me is what are we giving up? If, if that sort of system is rolled out, um, you know, it's concerning. And then I also see the other opportunity and the flip side and the opportunities, which is why I founded Unified Purpose to ultimately build a foundation with traditional sort of business models, particularly with online sales funnels and marketing techniques. So individuals can get their stories out in the right way. And I was lucky enough to, um, after dealing in the education sector and experiencing how slow they are to move on a particular opportunity that they needed, I realised that also the education side of things for my kid and the way that we need to educate needs to be more self-education. I stumbled across uh, the Knowledge Broker Blueprint with Tony Robbins and Dean Graciosi. So I really went down to that rabbit hole knowing that technology is moving so forward so quickly. We all cannot keep up individually. We need more of a collaborative collective model. So there's some connecting dots as I'll touch on as we get into more you know, your, your time slots and the questions that I'll ask. But that's where I'm coming from to basically make sure that me, myself, I can keep up with all the changes and the opportunities that are ahead, but then also uh, provide a platform for other people to make it easier for them to get into business, to not have to go down a venture capital road. And Kent, you'll talk about a bit about, uh, we all will with but Kent with crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, the same with yourself, Maya, with uh, human capital and it all interlinks. So, 
that's the platform that I'm building. All you guys, I look forward to inviting you to partake in ongoing uh, mastermind groups. This will be a foundation from the previous two that we've done, the next property development, uh, one that we do, a smart, sustainable property development. This will be the foundation for a unified purpose EXO mastermind. And yeah, like that's pretty much the backstory of what's driving me. While we're all together, we'll touch on it a bit as we get into this and the questions that we'll ask will help it all flow. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'd like to introduce or we go into more detail after the introduction with yourself, Ken. Uh, for those that aren't aware, um, look, ultimately, there's various conversations I'm having with all of you. I'm really uh, keen to support Kent's mission with OpenXO and that collective of consultants that are really innovating, helping organisations change the way they're going about things. My main target is to help consultants and someone like Maya without going down the road of OpenXO cannot help organisations and people adapt the way they need to adapt. So you're doing some great things. I love the summit you just did as well, Kent. Um, yeah, if you oh, can... You know, you've heard a bit of what I've mentioned. If you can make it all tie together and, and go into more detail on what you're doing. Great. Uh, thank you again so much, Dan. Um, what's going to happen is I'm going to show two or three things that, are, that I already know are going to dovetail into a lot of what the other panelists here are all doing. So at the end, we're going to have, a, I think, a pretty spectacular convergence. But I'll get started just by saying, um, Dan has mentioned a few times, Open EXO or EXO. That stands for Exponential Organizations. And the thing that I want to start with is just to show people, uh, all of us have, uh, if, we, if we think about why we do what we do, what, what makes us get up in the morning, many, many, many of us have uh, a massive transformative purpose. Now, is that backwards for you? I was about to say, right? yeah, if you do the mirror flip. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. Let me try to do that. One uh, yes, moment, please. Yes. Mirror my video. Better? Okay, great. I just flipped it. Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Gonna eat my time up, okay? One moment, I don't know Beating why. Your mirror. Yeah, if you get a video settings is a mirror my video. Yeah, that didn't work. So how about now? All right, great, beautiful. All right, sorry about that, everybody. So what the thing I wanted to show here is that text, not the tree, although it's a pretty tree, uh, it says empower people with technology. That's my massive transformative purpose. This is this MTP concept. It's the thing that gets you up. It's the thing that drives you. Dan mentioned this conference I just ran. He's mentioned OpenEXO. Uh, OpenEXO is a company that has its own massive transformative purpose to, to transform the world for a better future. In order to do that, we're trying to convene all the world's best minds uh, and provide tools and processes and ways for them to connect to one another and do what they do best, which is often just like everybody on this panel, driving really impactful projects that I like to think from kind of a, an alma mater of mine, Singularity University, where I now sit as faculty over the last seven years um, uh, to try to positively impact a billion people in 10 years or less. So if you set your goals that way, uh, if, you, if you have the audacity to think that maybe you might be able to do something like that, then building a company like this makes sense. So I co-founded OpenEXO with originally four other people. Uh, the current three co-founders are myself, Michelle Fox, and Salim Ismail. Uh, and if you're affiliated with OpenEXO at all, you know. And the thing that's important to note is that we're serious. Like we really are trying to find the ways to transform the world for a better future. For me, it's quite personal. Like you, Dan, I have children. I have three little boys. The world they're growing up into is going to be unrecognizable from the world that I grew up in. And so <laughs> maintaining flexibility and agility is key. And so over the last, uh, gosh, three to five years, depending on how you want to do the counting, uh, we've grown this community to 4,324 people. Uh, and these are some of the some of the most driven, impactful, insanely creative and amazing human beings on the planet. Uh, they come from all walks of life, every country, uh, every language. I think there's over uh, oh, at least over 80 languages from 112 countries. Last time I last time I checked, uh, and so it's it's a huge group of people, and all of them are going through a series of trainings and certifications, some of them community driven and some of them driven by us. And most importantly, 
we, we help them connect. So we created what most people would call forums. We call them circles. And in these circles, all of these people get together and they talk. So just take, this is live. Uh, so taking a look at a recent example, um, here's someone wanting some advice and thoughts about a pre-gap college year for daughter because she's, um, because COVID-19 is, is messing up everybody's college plans. You know, here's someone who wants to know how to run a remote EXO sprint during a pandemic, right? So digital technologies like what you see me using right now are pretty helpful for that, just for example. So we have a community, we create a place where they can talk to each other. But more than that, we've also created a place where they can transact with one another. And that's the Open EXO marketplace. So you come here and you can post something. So here's someone who needs a marketplace or digital platform advisor. And it's interesting because they're paying. Uh, this one's a paying gig and it's 100 US dollars and 200 exos. Believe it or not, we have our own global digital currency, uh, which is based on a blockchain uh, called exos, EXOS. So not only is this a platform, a community, a network of people, it is a global digital economy operating at scale. And, and that is pretty mind boggling when you try to tie it all together. Yeah, yeah it's, it's insane. And, you know, Dan and I, we've had a bunch of good chats about it. So he knows the, um, and then over here, uh, just because you mentioned it, Dan, I didn't have this tab open originally, but last week we ran something called the EXO World Summit. And this is important because we brought together uh, a little over 1800 people who want to know how to make the world better. That's why we did it. And now we're starting to cab that off into smaller regional and, uh, and local events that we're going to be calling EXO World now. The first one of those is going to be on May 12th. But the point is that we brought everybody together to show them two possible futures. Uh, my co-founder, Salim, he likes to say this one a lot. Is it going to be Mad Max or is it going to be Star Trek, right? I vote Star Trek and that's what I'm aiming for. And I love Maya's background because that's, that's a Star Trek future right there. And, um, and so we're, we're just having a great, great time bringing all these people together and giving them all the tools and capabilities they could ever need to do so. Now, what this means to me, uh, ultimately, is that I, I absolutely must be able to um, spend my time that I have here on this planet uh, uh, empowering people with technology. So in creating opening XO and in trying to bring all these people together and trying to find ways to make people uh, able uh, to support one another on dynamically, uh, across any number of projects at any scale. Uh, this is one of the best ways I've ever been able to find to, to live my MTP. Uh, you know, uh, uh, other ways are, are, are how I produced EXO World, which was, I think, might have been the world's first digital event of its kind like that, which kind of, I mean, some of you were there, so you know, and it, I still look back on it and I'm like, did that happen? <laughs> you know, it was, it was just, it was just amazing. And, uh, and, and we're going to keep doing it because it works. Mm. Um, and so anyway, all of those things that I just shared, it's not about me per se, but it's about me finding ways to share tools and techniques and processes and connections with everybody else. And that's where we connect Dan, you know, uh, and, and I, if I do that, then the world gets better for my children and all their friends and, and everybody else. And that's, that's a good day. If, if I get through a day and, and, and I've done a little bit of that, then I, I go to bed at peace and ready to go again the next morning. Uh, so, yeah. That's, you have that's great. So a couple of things I, uh, I took as well from the, the Exo World Summit, like there was a lot of questions in a breakout sessions around the future of consultancy. You know, there's oh, yeah. definitely with all this innovation, it's hard for them. What I found and what I took for them to price and then to also get that organisation to realise the implications of all these converging technologies. So you might want to touch on a little bit of that exo sprint process. And then okay. I'd also be interested to hear about like the crowdfunding, crowd lending, crowd sourcing, um, and how we could potentially like what I'm the conversations that we're going to have in the email. I'm going to go into it and probably simplify for you that long email I sent you, Ken. But how we attach the mastermind formulas. And someone like Steve Ferruccio is going to talk about, you know, having the right values and cultures within even those mastermind groups, not even just an organization. So we can connect the right experts and the right teams together in that skunk-like pro uh, process. 
um, to initiate change. And so I'm interested to hear about that, Ken. Sure. Um, so first of all, uh, it, it, you mentioned the sessions, and I just have to call out the fact that at that event, we allowed user-generated sessions over a period of 56 hours. We had over 150 user-run sessions during that time, many of which were recorded and we're in the process of processing them and getting them posted uh, so that people can watch them and learn from them again, and that's amazing. One of the things that we do uh, at OpenEXO is we, we support business processes that help people do transformation. The thing that you're mentioning, Dan, is called the EXO Sprint. Now, there are actually multiple versions of this concept. The one that I'm showing here on the screen uh, goes through three major stages, prepare, sprint, and execute. Uh, and then here, uh, and this is as drawn by uh, an organization called EXO Works, which is part of the EXO family. It does these sprints for some of the largest organizations in the world, okay, and has done it, I think, I I've lost count, uh, it's at least a few dozen times uh, by now. And it looks like this, you know, you go through uh, the planning stage and then you have an awake session, which is sort of that moment where everybody gets a taste of what a, a, the future could hold. And that's not all good news, right? It could be good, it could be bad. There are two sides to that coin, but then we get a line of what we want to achieve. And then we run through the sprint process, which goes through discovery, disruption, building and launching. And we do it in two parallel streams. There's one called the edge, which is where you operate to stay away from something that we call the organizational immune system, because not all the innovation you want to do can be done in the core of a company because the company will kill it. It has an immune system. It's basically malfunctioning. You want the immune system to kill the bad and keep the good. But unfortunately, over time, a lot of organizations tend to go the other way uh, and they, their immune system starts to squash anything new to keep what's old, to stay stable and no change. And that's what this system we teach the core how to become more agile while we're innovating at the edge and then we get out to launch and that pushes all the edge initiatives out and the core initiatives out as outcomes where we can execute obviously i am massively simplifying this process takes 10 weeks for an organization to run and it fundamentally changes i, I think of it as the dna the mindset uh, of, of, an, of a company and it can do it that fast this is the part that people don't like to believe sometimes that it can change that fast, but you can actually change in a second if you get the right inputs, mm. right? <laughs> We've all experienced that. Now, what if you want to scale that up? What if you want to go uh, uh, to the city level? So we built something. Uh, I helped co-found the Fast Track Institute uh, a few years ago, and the Fast Track Institute is operated in Miami and Bogota and uh, Medellin, Colombia, and a handful of other places with a version of the sprint that we call uh, the fast track. The fast track is the same thing designed, but for 16 week period, and it, ch it does, an organiz it does a, uh, a multi-organizational mindset shift for multi-stakeholder environment. It's, it's unbelievable when you're going through the solve period in particular, usually around the technology or entrepreneurial phase, the shift in mindset that occurs usually between week six and 10, it's, it's impossible to exactly predict it. But both of these are derivations of the same underlying thing, uh, which is, huh, I'm gonna have to, uh, let me see. Uh, let's hope we don't get anything super weird. Uh, not EXO the band, uh, the EXO, <laughs> that's hilarious. The EXO canvas, we could do it that way. So if we go here, uh, both of those processes, Dan, are instantiations of something called the EXO model. The EXO model is 10 attributes uh, and a massive transformative purpose, which I shared for you. I, I won't go into all of these now, but suffice it to say you can look this up easily. Uh, but these 10 attributes are all discussed in the book, Exponential Organizations. And if you implement uh, at least four of these, typically two from each side, then your organization is going to at least start, if not become an exponential organization. So what we try to get people to do. Mm. So that's about the sprint, Dan. And, and, and these are the processes that help organizations and cities and now even countries uh, begin to transform. And we have an entire core of consultants and advisors and trainers and, and all these people that have stepped up and taken on the mantle to help implement this model in companies. It's just crazy when I think about it, but it's been five years that we've been working on this, so. I'm assuming it's a big part of, I mean, one of the things I've got to mention before is like, a lot of what's driving me with this book called Bold, 
I'm assuming obviously you guys have applied it, like I've factored in as many of them I can, you know, that of that type of framework to, you know, this model. So what we might do, just being conscious of time, we're going to have an open conversation, Kent, if there's areas where, yep. I, look, I'd love to see uh, Raphael Asna has joined us. We're going to introduce and get straight into his content. I'll introduce that, but just before I do, uh, you know, I'd love to introduce you to Stephen uh, Ferruccio and let's explore adding to, you know, that diagram of people's skill sets, you know, their culture, their values when we're connecting these people together. Potentially, Ken, I'll introduce you guys. You guys can work it out. But for any other consultants, and if I can be part of that, great. But for any other consultants, um, you know, like myself, I mean, our foundation for the knowledge business or the consultancy, whatever you want to call it, running workshops, you know, doing mastermind groups, do consider the OpenXO platform to get certified. There's a free uh, founding course that you can do just to understand how you can innovate with your consultancy and apply it to your business. So, right. uh, Raphael, if you want to jump, I think you're on MOOC at the moment. Hi, hello. Hello, mate. Hello. You say you had a storm there um, coming a bit late. So, we've done the introduction. And um, pretty much, if you just want to roll from an introduction into what you're doing, and then uh, basically, from my point of view, from our discussions, um, you know, it's really Raphael's here as a uh, scientist, a biology scientist. He understands a lot about, I suppose, natural the earth, our resources, but also trains anywhere from people like me, aspiring entrepreneurs, up to billionaires. You know, shifting their mindset and relationship with money and. Um, I think it's important that regardless of what anyone's doing in business, whether it's sustainable living, it's, you know, you've got to be right as a person and we've all got strengths and weaknesses and uh, Raphael is going to contribute more on an individual level to, you know, the mindset that I think is a, a really relative uh, mindset to these mastermind formulas and the social enterprise type formula to, uh, you know, not hold all of the money for yourself when you get up and running and have success. You know, part of our mission is to have individuals or businesses you know, that's why I'm talking to Steve Ferruccio about setting up as a social enterprise to share money to worthy, worthy causes and a, and a network like Kent's that are real change makers. So over to you, Raphael, if you want to do an intro and roll into your what input you'd like to have, you'd be much appreciated, mate. Great. Thank you so much. Sorry I was a little late. We had a big storm. I'm on a little island off grid in Thailand. And uh, so everything's a little bit difficult. And, and I'm really about sustainability. I'm a biomedical researcher turned uh, consciousness and mindset um, scientist and artist, so to speak. And what I love to do is uh, I love to, I think of life as, um, as this phenomena on this planet where everything I see is thriving except for us humans and the species that we interfere with. Otherwise, a seed of grass, you drop it somewhere, it gets enough, it just gets the right nutrients and it has the capacity to cover most of the land. And it's like that with most life forms, except for us humans. Somehow we, we seem to be struggling in our ability to thrive. So I did a deep dive into it. And what I've discovered is that um, all life forms have sort of three gears or three operating modes. We can either be in survival mode and we're all born in survival mode. Uh, a seed has to shoot and sprout and the little roots have to go down and find nutrients and the leaves have to catch the air and the sun. And, most, most babies, baby animals come out and they need some help, some sort of support. We humans, we come out, we need, we're in survival mode. We need someone to take care of us. And we all have that survival mode gear within us. And then we reach a certain level of development and we can, we can jump into living mode, which allows us to grow. And if we're looking at a metaphor of a plant or a tree, we've sprouted, we've taken root. Now we're shooting, we're turning into a nice strong plant, a bush or tree. And with us as well, we're now you know, young teens and we, we're healthy, we, we can participate in all the things that life has to offer us. And then we reach a critical stage where we can actually uh, shift into thrive mode. And thrive mode is about flowers and fruits and abundance. And we have this capacity to naturally generate massive abundance, all life form does. And um, with many animals um, and many life forms, we produce lots of offspring. We, we human don't produce a lot of offspring. We have a different capacity. We have the capacity to generate massive creative abundance. We can create so much and you just see how many things we've created on this planet. So if we can all accept that we have these three gears, the additional thing we need to understand is that for us humans, we're not just physical bodies, we're minds. 
we're minds. We're the only species that can have our minds on 24 seven. All other life forms, all other animals, they're in a state of no mind. They need to do something. They turn on a little mind that gets them from point A to point B, it shuts off and then they're back, back to neutral, back to just being present. So we humans have physical bodies. So what we need to do is we need to learn, first of all, what gear we're in physically. Because sometimes um, we're fine physically. Everything's okay. We're not in survival mode. Nothing's trying to kill us. We're not in danger. We're not in danger of dying or getting eaten. But psychologically, we can be stuck in survival mode. So I do this simple exercise I like to run you, everyone through, which is um, the first question is, to anyone who's listening, are you physically in survival mode? Which means, are you in danger of dying? Is something trying to eat you? Could, were you going to get hit by a wave or a storm? And if the answer is yes, then um, you probably should be online right now. You should be dealing with whatever's trying to hurt you because it's survival time. But if you had breakfast or you, you had a little sleep, you have enough food for the, for the day and nothing's trying to eat you, you don't physically need to be in survival mode. But psychologically, you might believe that you're in survival mode. So what I find is that most of us physically, um, we're okay. We're not in survival mode. We're in survival mode psychologically which means that for us, we have ideas around money, around a number, an imaginary number that it really is uh, something that we co-create. Nothing else uses money, only humans. So the question I have for people is, are you in survival mode psychologically? Are you in living mode or are you in thriving mode? Now, I'm gonna define survival mode as you you barely have a place to sleep. You barely have a meal for the day. And uh, you, you're going to lo lose that. So you have to scramble. You have to go out there and find, find food, find shelter. And if that's not the case, then you might just be, you might have enough to live, which is you work, you work day to day, you take care of everything and you run out of the, at the end of the day, you're, you, maybe you end up with zero, but you wake up the next day and you can go out and you can get some more resources. And that would put us in living mode. Thriving mode is when you have time to actually sit, relax, be creative, um, write some music or just play on a keyboard or just draw or doodle or just think about how you're gonna get from point A to B and you have the discretionary time. So what happens to us is that when we're in survival mode, our intuition and our creativity functions differently when, than when we are in living mode or in thriving mode. Right? We all have creativity, we all have intuition. We all have the capacity of having a flash of creativity, a little burst of intuition, or the other way around, a burst of intuition, a flash of creativity. And all humans can have that. The question is, what are the conditions we need in order to have a flash of creativity, a flash of intuition? And I've broken it down, it comes down to the following things. If you're in a, in a body that's pain-free, your emotions are just flat and calm for a moment. And your mind, you can just take a breath, stop it and reboot it. You will automatically have a flash of creativity or intuition. It's just kind of how we're hardwired, right? So if we have a place to sleep and we have enough food and we have some money in our bank account, um, physically, we're, we have what we need to thrive. But psychologically, we might think that those numbers aren't enough. So physically, we might be ready to thrive. Our bodies aren't in any danger, but psychologically, we're stuck in survival mode. So then what happens is that um, our creativity, our thinking, our intuition is all focused on, on things about survival. And they're not about generating abundance because someone in survival doesn't think about how to generate abundance. All we think about is how to get out of our problem and how to get to safety, right? Mm. So it's really interesting to look at yourself and just, just have a meditation on it. Just contemplate. Just think about it. Write down some numbers. Now, I'm going to throw some basic numbers out there that cover just about everyone on the planet. And, of course, there are exceptions. But in my, in my studies around the world, um, I've found that there are people, the majority of people on this planet are living with anywhere between $1 and $10 a day. $1 and $10 a day is enough for them to live. Now, most of us, if we only had up to ten dollars, um, we'd probably be freaking out a little bit. We'd be scared. We'd be like, "What are we going to do? We've only got ten dollars." But the fact is that with ten dollars, um, you can get enough food for a day, and you can probably get plastic bags. You can you can shelter yourself. You you could survive on ten dollars a day. Um, but could you live? Could you thrive? Right. 
So our mind works with decimal systems. So one to ten dollars is a bracket, right? Where most people that are in that are going to be in survival or in living mode. Um, what about ten to a hundred dollars? If you had access to the equivalent of ten to a hundred dollars a day in most parts of the world, you you could live. You might think you're in survival mode because you don't have the number that you imagine in your head that you're supposed to have, but you do have enough um, to actually live. And if your numbers are between a hundred and a thousand dollars a day, you significantly have enough to thrive psychologically. That is, yes, sir. Yes, was that question? But yeah, just yeah. I'm just going to time on one more minute, and then we'll we'll go into more detail with the at the end with the open conversation. Sorry to interrupt. Right. Yep. Yep. I was tracking the time. Right. So what I would last what I would invite people to do is to uh, consider that maybe physically you're okay, and you don't have to be in survival mode. And just learn how to take a breath, relax, reframe what the numbers mean in your head. If you have enough to cover your basic expenses, which could be you could be working <clears throat> minimal wage in a fast food place, and you could have enough time to doodle and draw. You might think you're in survival mode, but you could actually be in thriving mode. And if you can put yourself into that mindset, and I'll explain how to do that separately, um, your mind will start thinking differently. In other words, you can think how to get to the next level instead of why are all these problems? Why am I in survival mode? Why am I afraid? Why are people out to get me? Why do I know, know how I'm going to respond to the situation like that we're at now? Um, what if you do have enough? And you don't have to be in, in that gear. You don't have to be in reverse, right? You don't have to be in survival mode. You can just psychologically put yourself into thrive mode. You're going to start recognizing patterns of abundance that will allow your creativity and your intuition to, to, to flower. And by doing so, you can start uh, growing. You can start thinking about how to grow from wherever you are, which could be minimally or somewhere in the middle or somewhere higher up. So, right, I hope. that's been really good. And I think just to connect a few things, with, um, you know, with the creativity and intuition, I love that because with that abundance mindset, if people can get into it, which we do have, I feel within the mastermind type of formula and technologies that we can achieve so much if they're used the right way. So we do have that abundance and there is that opportunity. And um, I think that's a great uh, intro to yourself, Stephen, as well. I think there's some relative things that you can apply to the values and the culture and the mindset as an organizational level as well. And we'll come back, Raphael. We've got an open discussion at the end. And um, for anyone that's wanting more details on Raphael, there is some free offers for anyone in our community to help you know, reboot the minds, free courses and stuff. So over to you, Steve. Thanks, Dan. And I love all the stuff you've been saying there, Raphael. It's so synchronous with all the research and the technology we're implementing at ShareTree. Uh, I want to touch on a few points there. The first one is that sense of enough. So we've worked with a lot of high wealth individuals that have beyond abundance, uh, but they're still trapped in the mind, as you said. So that sense of fulfillment most often is not related to money. Uh, but there is a global challenge that we have at the moment as well with a massive disparity because of a monetary system. There, in a natural order, if you look at a tribe, there is a natural order to the flow of value exchange, which is what money was created for yeah, as a measure of value exchange. But it's got to the state in our society that it's distorted. At the moment, the global average income of the highest versus the lowest is 276 to 1. 276 to one. That means for my family, would I take 276 uh, times more than the rest of my family? And if we look at ourselves as a global family, that's what's happening. You wouldn't do it to your own family, but somehow we're doing it to the global humanity. Now, we've done studies. My background uh, has gifted me with a uh, mild dyslexia. So I see patterns and I've modeled across the world income um, distribution in a more fairer pattern. And what, what we looked at was 30 to one. 30 to one is a 50,000 income to 1.5 million a year. If you can't live sustainably, happily and fulfilled on 1.5 million a year, I would challenge people to say, well, there's something psychologically going on there that's not quite right. So the world has enough abundance. Nature shows us that every single time. When we look around at nature, nature is in harmony and abundance. And if you look at the human species, and in some ways I think COVID-19 has been a slap in the face for a wake up call for humanity. Yeah, we're consuming at such a rate that we're devouring our own planet 
and our own collective humanity. Uh, and, and it's to wake us up to get back into harmony. And there is enough there. We just need smarter technologies and systems. And what we've done with ShareTree, uh, my background's in continuous improvement. So I was fortunate enough to work with Bosch and they sent me all around the globe. And I saw all these amazing systems and technologies to innovate and make things thrive. So when I started our organization, the first organization I started was called Vative for continuous improvement. And we were tracking 47 companies over 10 years about what makes them sustainably thrive. And it was out of the nine inputs that we tracked and it was budget and technology, size and industry and all of these things, it's only two things. And it was mindset of leadership and it was the culture of the team. Nothing, nothing else had a direct correlation besides those two things. So when we delve in deeper, and it, it links back to what Rafael was saying before, when it came to the mindset of the leadership, there was only really three key elements and one stood out more than the, the other two. And the one was purpose. The other one was innovation and wisdom. So the ability to lead with purpose so people have a, a, a greater capacity to follow you and endure challenges and to have the wisdom and the innovation to create something, to innovate. But the one that empowered both of those was actually gratitude. And out of all of the virtues that we have in our system that we've tracked, gratitude is the only one that will create high states of flow and take you out of a state of unhappiness into flow and happiness the quickest. And it does that because it engages biologically with us, serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, and endorphins. No other virtue, no other character trait out of all of them does all four at once. Purpose is the next best one. So we built this into technology. So what we do with every single team that we engage with is we put character and gratitude at the forefront of their engagement. So that the technology prompts people to form habits that are commonly natural to us, but we've forgotten somehow along the way. And it helps us every day to say, okay, what can I be grateful? There's, a, there's normally a thousand things to be grateful for in a day. But as Raphael pointed out before, the mind tends to look at where the negatives are and operate out of a sense of threat, but it's not our reality in most cases. So with our technology, you, you can actually wake yourself up again to be reminded every day of what is there to be grateful for? And not only to be grateful, but to express it to the person where you see a strength in their own character. And by building up the character strengths of each other within the team and living to our united values of what we are uniquely strong about in our culture, then all, all of us together thrive. Now, to tackle the disparity issue, what we've done with all our social enterprises is that every one of our people within our network voluntarily subscribe to a 30 to one cap. So if we ever get to the state where we have created such amazing innovation that the world values it so much that they pour and flood money into our enterprise, then the role of that person changes as it would if I was in a tribe. And if I'm in a tribe and I reach the state of abundance, my role is to mentor and contribute back to the new generations and the up and coming. And that's the way we'd model our social enterprises. That's fantastic. And that's, um, hopefully you can see that connection there, Kent, to your organisation. And, you know, my, my mission and goal is to, you know, I had the Singularity University course and the 12 Global Grand Challenges. And, um, you know, I just that's something that I want to support. I'm, even though I'm sort of, and um, struggling to get this business going, I'm in the mindset of how am I going to give back and um, what are the things I want to contribute to. So hopefully we can connect these two and, and apply that and then apply that to the mastermind formulas because I think that's a recipe for a real change and success there. Um, Could I add one more thing, Dan? Of course, mate. Yep. Uh, what Raphael was talking about before, everything <coughs> that is so synchronous and that's why we use the model of the tree because our, our own human evolution is synchronous to nature. And the seven core needs that we found out of the individual's own evolution that relate to a team's culture's needs. And they had a need to feel safe, the need to feel supported, the need to feel a sense of accomplishment, the need to feel valued, which is at the core of us, the heart, the need to feel autonomy and freedom, and the need to feel evolved, to engage with our curiosity to learn and build wisdom. And, and our highest need is our need for meaning, purpose, and contribution back to our collective species. So by engaging in the needs and understanding where a team is in terms of fulfilling those needs for your people, then you can set strategies to engage the people, to engage the culture, which ultimately lead to your success. 
but people just keep chasing profit for some reason uh, and they keep wondering why they keep falling over. And that's one of the key reasons why we have 68% startup success rate. So when we get into the, the offline masterminds, you guys maybe not in this interview or we can bring it up, but I'm very interested. And I know in our conversation, Kent, we talked about that struggle between the, the, the need for people or the, just the inner, it's maybe it's a survival thing of what's in it for me, how am I going to get paid as opposed to this collective and you know who's worth what in terms of their contribution. So at the end, I think if we can go, or if you have a quick comment to make now, Kent, before we move on. Well, uh, if you take a look at how we structured the revenue model and payout model for EXO World, it was also, I think, one of the world's first cooperative events. It was actually a digital cooperative. So everybody that worked, and there were dozens and dozens of people that made that real, um, uh, uh, was part of the uh, downstream model in that. And everything else gets plowed directly back into the community and a significant amount of it went to uh, is in the process of going to charity. So uh, that is one that the community is helping to choose. So uh, I really resonate a lot with what Steven's saying and, and thanks for the uh, uh, let me make that extra comment, Dan. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that as well. And again, how we attach, you know, from a business building point of view, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, those values and the skill sets they're bringing in to have some sort of pre-mechanical system to work out those contributions for sweat equity deals and stuff like that. Um, right, so now we'll go who you're very familiar with um, yourself, Kent, and thank you so much, Steve. Um, love it, mate. Uh, Maya, over to yourself. Love to hear more about you connecting a few of the dots with um, what you've heard already and then, you know, what you're doing with Leman and uh, regenerative. regenerative. Yeah. I can't get it out. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, well, highly resonant conversation and everything's connected. And uh, I was kind of thinking, I, I only put on two slides for myself. Uh, may I uh, project slides? Yes. Can I you just need a, I it? need to be able to uh, screen share. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start as you're, uh, let me know if, if you yeah. figure it out and okay. I'll, I'll start. So there's a lot of things that just are connected. Stephen, your, your work sounds amazing and very aligned. Um, and the conversation of uh, what are we here to do on this planet? And especially during these times, the big question that I keep asking myself is what is essential? As we learn that things are, um, are different, are not as, um, not as, uh, uh, as they were before. Um, and, oh, there we go, thank you. Can you see my quick slide, yes. two slides? Yes. So I was gonna talk about <laughs> a little bit about myself and what I do in the world, but your conversation, both Stephen and Kent uh, got me thinking and I added another slide, but um, I just I'm definitely gonna do a plug into, I'm a consultant and coach with OpenEXO and it's been a very, I'd say powerful experience <laughs> so far and love it and you know, put in a lot of hours into it. Um, uh, and I, for me to always try and explain what I do is hard because I don't do one thing. I really look at everything from a systems perspective and I do a lot of different things. And that's why I also serve more than one company, Lumen being the first one that really looks at the human connection. Um, if we are going to be changing the world and we do it with the same uh, uh, human operating system, nothing's going to work. And every company I've ever been to, the ones that worked worked because of the people and the ones that didn't work, didn't work because of the people. And, and that's it. Like we either fix the way we are in right relationship to each other and things work or we don't. It's a, it's, it's a decision, but it's also deep work. Um, and that's why I thought of bringing in another model of mine, uh, which is, uh, it's called the regenerative entrepreneur and leader model. Uh, and there's an article, we can send it afterwards, it's pretty uh, in-depth. And it's more a mapping exercise that I did on what does it mean to actually become a leader for these times? And what are every aspect that I need to think about and we need to think about as leaders? And for me, everything went back to one concept that is actually in the center here and is also at the circle outside and it is sacred reciprocity. And the idea uh, of sacred reciprocity, the, 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 the two specific languages from, um, from the Amazon, uh, the 
uh, Shapibo uh, word is Akinananti, and the Aini, uh, and the Quechua word is Aini. And uh, the idea that we are all connected and everything we put out there comes back to us because the earth is a living, breathing system. And when we actually translate it to how we do business and how we work together, we come from that frame of mind, then we shift everything we do. Um, the, the Native Americans called it, um, we are the land. Uh, and Thich Nhat Han talked about the interbeing that we are the interbeing and, and the earth is the interbeing. And there is actually, there is spirituality, but it's also reality because none of us are even human. We're like 10% human and 90% mitochondria and different cultures and bacteria and all these different living cells um, that, uh, that make what it is a human. And then our relationships and the way we relate to each other are not completely conscious. And, and I know that Raphael talked about it, yeah, I, I think it's, I actually don't think animals are completely unconscious all the time. They actually, their minds do operate more than we think, but none of us are singular beings. We all are interconnected. Trees, they're actually even thinking that trees are not a tree anymore. A tree without a forest is a weird individual that is disconnected, but truly trees are an organism and a forest is an organism. Uh, so if we bring more of that understanding into the way we do business, we actually start relating in a very different way. Um, and I've, uh, you know, th this specific model, as I said, it's, it's a pretty in-depth model. Uh, it talks about everything from the essence of you know, being a conscious and leader in sac sacred reciprocity, uh, our vision, our identity and our missions, our purpose. Um, the principles that are values and actions, because one of the things that I've, and I've, I've ran a lot of startups and I've built a lot of startups and I'm always somehow in the middle of building a new startup while, while I'm working for another group. And people always talk about values. What are our values? And I find that that is a difficult conversation without actually understanding how we act on those values. And then I call, that's why I call them principles as values in action. It's not, I'm accountable. It's our, our agreement together as a community. When we say accountability, what we mean is this is how we act. And when is, that is broken, we know how to actually bring it back together. I, I'm, I'm very still, it still amazes me that when we come into uh, working together in startup communities, the first thing is not how do we work together? Everybody's first thing is how do we solve this problem? And as we know, we cannot solve the problem from the same mindset that we created it. And if we actually start by just asking what the problem is without actually understanding who we are in the relationship to each other and why we're here and do we align, is, is my vision aligned with your vision and come to some agreement? And that's why the MTP world work is so important because when we align as a group that our massive transformative purpose is the same, we can even start asking the, the beautiful questions of what do we need to actually solve? How will we solve it, et cetera? Um, you know, it, that is still something that in the, in the kind of day-to-day -day business world is the thing that you think about later. And then down the line, you see why these companies might not work because they never aligned, they never actually had an agreement field. And, it, and it's, it's beyond just the contractual agreements of by law, how do we work together? It's more what, when I say something, do you actually understand what I'm saying? Are we in agreement? What happens when things break down? Uh, are people safe in the conversation to actually build something together? Is it an inclusive and diverse community? Because also diversity and inclusion is, is a diversity is a make of a very good system, uh, especially an ecosystem in, in nature. So di for me, diversity is something that I know when I see it, it's, it will actually contribute to that system, whether it's a business organization, group, or whatever, will work, um, will continuously thrive uh, moving forward. So all of those questions that I, when I started kind of working on this model came up to create something that looks basically like a circle of everything can be part of this. And then beyond that, there is um, leadership style uh, because these times ask us for becoming different leaders. Uh, there is a, a lot of growth that we need to do as leaders and even come uh, be somber 
and sober to the reality that is here right now and the there's a lot of opportunity and, and yes my background is about star trek and is about a world that works um but we cannot uh not see or be blind to the fact that there's going to be a lot of hardships and how do we prepare how do we prepare our people how do we put on the um, you know, we use the uh, metaphor of oxygen masks on, a, 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 on ourselves before we put it on anybody else. That's what they tell you on, on a flight. And it's funny that, uh, and, and very telling that these are the times where an oxygen mask and a ventilator is actually a very different conversation and putting on mask is actually needing to breathe better. Um, so these times are actually asking us to go into these metaphors really deeply. Uh, and, and as I said, I'm also a science fiction writer, and I, I think through these scenarios, and, and what I love about science fiction is it gets you to think beyond yourself and look backwards into a perspective of, you know, what is this reality we're actually dealing with? And, and the business reality that is coming to us is going to be very different. So how are we actually creating not only opportunities, but a safety net for our teams, our companies, our organizations? coming through these times. Um, and that's why, you know, looking at the leadership style and at the top of it is a regenerative leader. Um, but also I'm using, this is Lumen IO's conversation of a creation leader, um, where these times are not about a, a leader that gets money, it's a leader that creates together with its team, with their teams, uh, and changes their mindset, behaviors, and outcomes together. Um, and here I even talk about beyond that, like what are the business models that are, are showing up, um, you know, from company culture to partnerships to aligning with the sustainable development goals, which by the way, personally, I do love them, but I think the 2030 to 2050 goals should be the regenerative and restorative goals without the conversation of development, because development still talks about growth. And I think there is some issue with keep talking about growth in a, in a um, uh, limits to growth planet with planetary boundaries that we have actually crossed many of them at this point. Um, and, and it's also why I actually really love EXO because exponential organizations digitally work really well, but humans cannot be exponential. So I, I love the paradox that um, that actually brings in like where, and, and even when I, uh, as part of EXO, you, when you're become a co coach, you actually have to I work with your team on a couple of projects and our project asked the question in the end, like how do you actually find a, a wonderful bridge between exponential organization and regenerative mindset and regenerative businesses? And where does that actually come together? Because I think that's where we need to go next. It, it's both, it's not one or the other, it's both in a really healthy way. So uh, so that's, a, you know, try to connect the dot from everything that yeah, I've heard. That's so yeah. good, Maya. like love it, love your images. There's a couple in the chat asking for, and just on everything, uh, if you guys as panelists and experts want to contribute anything, I'm going to compile a follow-up email. There's some people saying I love the slides and um, what have you. So I'll look through all of that and we'll, we'll do a follow-up email. So I think Steve has a uh, free offer as well. And I love that. I'm looking forward to getting together with you and Kent and talking more about you know, working together and piecing this and just making this all happen, guys. Um, so from there, I mean, it was about six months ago, early days, I suppose, with Robert Palmer. I did an interview around sustainable um, development. And obviously, Robert Palmer introduced himself before, but we'll, we'll again open this up, Maya. I think there'll be some back and forth with, you know, thank you for connecting those dots, all fits. Now we're going to Rob Palmer, if you can introduce more of your views and connect the dots and introduce what you're doing as well. Uh, Robert. All right. all right. Thank you, Dan. I just want to say, man, it's really comforting and reassuring to listen to all you speak. It's like connecting on a, on a level like this. I've been you know, looking for here in California and to find all these people in one room is just fantastic. Uh, I had a mm -hmm. few points I wanted to uh, share from this conversation that people um, were saying. Just pull up real quick. Um, Kent, I really uh, synergize a lot what you said with the exponential organizations. And uh, actually, your work at Singular University has really inspired me to build my vision. And I was like, um, I saw a sheet about uh, exponential entrepreneurship, you know, said going for that moonshot vision, you know, 10x, 10x, everything. And I went with it. I was like, all right, he's telling me to go big and go crazy. So I went for it. And I created a really great uh, big plan I'm going to talk more about later. Uh, also, Raphael, what you mentioned with the survival mode, 
uh, same time going to this 10x thing and doing my research and my, all these solutions are available i was kind of losing myself i was going crazy it's like wow the world's in this crazy place we're about like either it's gonna go great or it's gonna go terrible we have all these amazing solutions and like what is people talking about it and i was in survival mode and i was having a really hard time in building my business so um, a tip of advice to anyone watching this is if you're in survival mode you cannot be in survival mode you cannot build a business in survival mode it's really difficult next to impossible so I would just encourage you, fix your survival mode first, get out of the situation, get into living, and then potentially get into thriving. Uh, now I'm in thriving mode. Things are going great. All my businesses are succeeding, and I'm just super happy. I uh, so just want to share that tip of advice. Uh, Steve, I love that 30 to 1 salary cap. I want to implement that. I really love that. I think it's going to be uh, ingenious. Uh, and Maya, I synergize all your points, and uh, I really appreciate, like, the conversation is really deep, and we're talking about, like, the biggest problems and the fundamental aspects of humans and, like, how we work together. And it reminded me of something I read recently. It was uh, basically like looking at all the animals, like what makes humans different? Uh, you look at the, the super, super organisms of, of all humans. And what makes us different is that we are able to consciously cooperate at scale. Uh, just so for reference, that means uh, co collaborating at scale, right, is the difference between like a bear who hunts by himself and you know, maybe with a pack uh, versus a pack of birds, right? They all fly together and they all work together in, in a larger way. Uh, but the difference is, another good example is like uh, all, uh, colonies of ants, right? They're able to harvest food, bring it back to the, the, the tribe. Um, but a funny example was the difference between those animals and us is that we're conscious in what we're doing. Um, so a good example was an ant colony can uh, overtake uh, their, their queen and, and establish a democracy, right? Like these are the only things that humans can do. We can actually decide where we want to go. And that's what basically... That's what makes us different. So we need to utilize our strongest asset, which is that ability. And I did a kind of like a, I'm a very system thinker like you, Maya. And I kind of took an inventory of the world after leaving college. And I realized, you know, a lot of our problems basically on organizing ourselves. Like, you know, we need to have a vision and we know what we all do. And we need to all do our independent things towards that one goal. And my answer trying to, and trying to do that as I, I lean towards supply chain management software. And in turn, that's exactly what it does. It unites all the uh, participants in a supply chain, the farmer, the processor, manufacturers, to the retailer, down to the consumer, into one ecosystem, and is able to share information, share payments, stuff like that. And it's basically how the whole world functions, you know. Um, so then I, I begin that research. Um, I actually have something I wanted to uh, share just to show. Can I see my share my screen? Oh, click there. Okay, you guys see my screen? You guys see this? Yeah, Matt, we got you. Cool. Uh, so this just came out today from the World Economic Forum, and it's talking about um, the need for having development of su supply chains relative to the blockchain. Um, and it's really correlated to the COVID situation that happened and how it disrupted the supply chains. Um, but basically, it's, it's talking about the, the, the way to solve our biggest problem and, and meeting the world's needs. But we have the, the solutions. We just need to connect it. Um, and we do that with, with supply chain uh, software. So this is a very interesting article, and in response to that, uh, I wrote a white paper that talked about you know how we're able to do these things using blockchain. And this we want to bring Industry 4.0 into the mix. Uh, it's an incredible time, right? So I just said like the answer to solving the world's problem is supply chain management software, and all of a sudden we have the, these great digital technologies to, to do that. And I realized that blockchain, IoT, and AI are best suited for supply chain management, right? So you have the, the sensors that are gathering data from the, from the world, from, from our supply chains, that's feeding into computer systems uh, that get stored in blockchain databases so they can be uh, you know, altered and changed. And then we have AI that's analyzing all that information and just streamlining it, making it more efficient, optimizing it for where we want to go, uh, which is going to take a lot of fat off of our supply chain, making it more efficient, more lean. And that's going to allow us to get what we want faster. And we have a strategic advantage, right? We're in an, in, we're in an industrial revolution. So this gives the opportunity to, you know, to leap beyond the, the current infrastructure and where things are at right now. And that's what we need to do, uh, take to our advantage, right? So all the people in this group, all the people that we're working, networking with, uh, we need to be educated on Industry 4.0 and using that for the people because we all know the corporations are going to adopt it. But we need to be able to, uh, you know, unite these technologies with the people. So that's why I really love what you're doing, Kent. I think that's like the most disruptive business model. Um, it's beautiful. Um, another thing, so I, I, I wrote this back in 2018. And it did a pretty good job of telling, you know, what I think we need in terms of the supply chain software side. Um, but the good news is a lot of that's really developed. It's more about, you know, changing the vision of how to use it, right? With like tokenizations of assets and, you know, and tokens and whatnot. Um, but then I moved on into focusing on the infrastructure side of things. 
so I wrote this proposal for, I call it California 4.0, and it's about building smart infrastructure in California uh, for the hemp industry, like I mentioned. So there's a reason why I love hemp. It's because it's the most versatile resource on the planet. It can feed you, it can house you, it can clothe you, you can drive a car with its electric batteries, the whole car being made out of hemp. It just does so many things, and it's so productive and efficient at doing so. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know the stats on it, but just, just comparing a few metrics, um, this is talking about clothing, right? Hemp, hemp fabrics versus cotton. Hemp uses one third times less water and chemicals as cotton does. So that alone, and cotton textiles right now is one of the biggest polluters on the planet. So just by simply replacing cotton for hemp, right? We were just, you know, 10x our, uh, you know, solving our problems. Um, paper production, tree, uh, hemp grows four times the amount of cellulose as trees do, right? So that's another major problem is stopping deforestation. What also love about hemp is, is that the amount of CO2 that it absorbs um, as it grows and it stores into the soil. As we mentioned before, uh, with hempcrete, uh, you mix the, the inside of the hemp plants, the hemp herd, you mix it with lime and water, right? Very simple ingredients and it acts as a carbon sink for the rest of its life. So it's constant, constantly going to be sucking CO2 to harden it itself. So if we were making our housing out of this, our walls out of this, and not only is it a sustainable building solution, it's also solving, solving climate change by reducing CO2. So just to show like this plant is absolutely incredible. So that's why we're really focused on building infrastructure for the hemp industry because of it, its vast importance. So I wrote this document kind of explain what we're doing there, everything from the farming, Central Valley, to decortication, manufacturing, distribution, kind of is all laid out in this uh, one deck right here. Um, and the way they were making this happen, right, as I said, they have a really big vision, a really big plan. This business plan alone is, is, is a project, right, that's um, somewhere around, it needs a billion dollars to fund. And like, that sounds crazy. Like, how can you build a billion dollar business from scratch? Well, in 2017, there's an amazing opportunity that hit the United States. Um, can't remember the name right now, but it's basically the Opportunity Zone program. And what it did was it created a, a capital gains tax deferral system for uh, basically institutional banks and accredited investors. And what that means, capital gains is when you buy a stock a thousand, it appreciates the extra capital gains. When you sell that stock, you usually gotta pay taxes on it. So what the government did was like, if you sell your stock and you have capital gains and you put that into an opportunity zone fund, you can defer your, your tax gains for up to 10 years. And at the end of the 10 years, you actually pay nothing on, 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 on that capital gain. So that's like really crazy, right? So especially for the US economy, the US economy is the largest economy in the world. And based on the fact that we had a, the past 10 years, we had economic growth. Now, you know, everyone's saying we're gonna have an economic recession pretty soon, especially because of the COVID situation. So a lot of companies are gonna be selling all that capital gain they just got. And that's gonna be feeding into these programs. And the IRS estimate there's about $6 trillion worth of capital gains looking to go into these opportunity zone uh, funds. And just because it was started in 2017, there's not enough projects for this capital to go into. As to date, um, there's about 500 opportunity zone funds represents roughly about uh, 50 billion, 100 billion dollars worth of actual funding. And we have 6 trillion, right? So there's just so much opportunity on the table. And what the industry, opportunity zone side really needs is more people of like us, our type, to create big ideas for, these, for this money to go to the funds. Um, so that's what I'm also working on. So I created a, uh, a hemp OZ fund, uh, me and my business partner. And this lays out the, the whole infrastructure plan I just talked about. So, you know, it's like I said, farming land, decortication, processing and whatnot. And you could just see through this uh, pretty simple slide, total cost of product is 575 million. And this is with one OZ fund. And there's no limit to the number of OZ funds you can fund. And actually the real sauce is the project, an opportunity zone project can take unlimited capital from multiple OZ funds. So this is how we're able to say like, uh, we want to build a city in Maya's background right now. Like this is who's going to build it, who's going to design it. These are the people that farm it. If you can get the people together, this money, the money will come. And I already actually proven the model. Um, this proposal for California 4.0, I that kind of lays out the vision. It has a lot of pictures and talks about, uh, uh, you know, how we're all bit one, one cooperative, all working together, and it's all aligned for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I sent that to an expert in the opportunity zone industry, and he was completely baffled. He was saying this is a top five, top 10 percent project proposal he's ever seen in the, in the opportunity zone space. And and he doesn't even know half of it. This is kind of an outdated document where I saw it to him. And I now like connected with all you guys and the uh, further connection I just made recently in, in 2020 alone, we're at top 1%, top 2%, right? So it's a really amazing opportunity to have and, and raising lots of capital to fund our ideas. Cause that was the biggest thing I, I saw, especially in the cannabis space, there was a lack of access to funding. And like, the, I think the ideas are there. You have the entrepreneurs are ready to do it, but we don't have the, the funding, the capital going to support them. And I just, just to develop an MVP, like everybody was expecting the entrepreneur to have its own generating business and 
you know, to make revenue before they can actually raise money. And that's not necessarily the case. So I'm really big on research and development and supporting entrepreneurs. And my kind of grand vision is a city down here called California City. And I'm really wanting to make it the, the, um, like the emblem of California, right? Rep all the things that California represents, technology, uh, beautiful nature, uh, the diversity of people, all in one place. You know, I wanna bring back world fairs and just showcase the best technology, but also how we're using it to build sustainable cities. I look at and that's kind of yeah. like the And on that, way. sorry to interrupt, Rob, but on that, what we might do is let's continue on that um, at the end of this, because we're gonna finish okay. with Michael McElliott, uh, who I'm sure is busting out to contribute, provide some info. Okay. Kent's just pulled up a banging bloody background with his smart city. Um, obviously, guys, we're going to talk a lot more about this and work at how we work together. It all connects. Um, and what I put next, and thank you so much, Rob. That was awesome, brother. Uh, was Jim Gale, who, you know, I'm having conversations to help with his food forest abundance and help scale with his um, online marketing and stuff like that and masterminds. Um, but he's doing some amazing things with permaculture, as you mentioned, with food forest abundance, um, which is a great solution. There could be some, some connections there in terms of managing that on blockchain and where food is required in different parts of the community. So one group grows this food, uh, food and et cetera. So, um, but on a micro level in someone's house or a farm, as you mentioned, uh, Jim, please introduce more about what you're doing. And, and again, just connect the dots with, you know, in the interaction with other experts you've heard provide input. Yeah, I love it, Dan. Thank you. Um, so there's one thing more powerful than all of the armies of the world. And most of you probably heard this quote by, I believe it was Victor Hugo, and that is an idea whose time has come. And what I've been working on for 13 years, I was, I sold a mortgage company that did about $1.3 billion in volume. I bought a boat for a while and then I got bored with that and I moved to Costa Rica because I was looking for purpose again. And when I was there, I had my first daughter and then my second daughter. I've got four daughters now. I'm 50 and uh, just had, I have a seven month old in case you hear her screaming in the background. When I learned, when somebody told me about permaculture, I'd never heard of it. And they told me that we're killing our world. I was curious because I've always been a nature lover. They called me nature boy growing up, right? But I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I started studying permaculture. At the same time, I started studying kind of the behind the scenes of what's going on in the world. And it scared the shit out of me. I got very worried that my daughters, that my grandkids would either not be born or be born into a hellish situation. But I'm an optimist. Like, I, I am very much believer that we are spirit and that you know there's a lot of other stuff going on but at the physical level right i i went down the rabbit hole and i started studying from a perspective of what can i do to help and what i found was the science that has proven the world over how easy it is to be sustainable so i kept asking the question how can we catalyze a shift in consciousness that is that idea whose time has come. So um, I, I was in Costa Rica. I built a couple communities that had all the food. There's ridiculous amounts of food and it's perennial food. Now, for those of you who don't know the difference between annuals and perennials, annuals are the typical farm in the United States and in, in Australia, everywhere around the world where there's monocrops. Monocrops are like lawn, except for most of them provide a yield, right? Um, and that's why lawn is just so ridiculous. But monocrops that don't provide a yield or that provide a yield, it still does not mimic a natural process, which means it's unsustainable. All unsustainable systems fail. Our health, so how can, we, how can we create a vision is what I asked that is adopted by the world as this idea. So I started playing with it. I started creating these visions and people started saying, Jim, why aren't we doing this at home? I said, well, that's a good question. So I kept asking new questions, new questions. And it led me to this vision, which I'm trying to make larger right now. Let me see here. It's weird. That one won't open. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, screen share. Share. Okay, can you all see a Word document? Got that. Okay, so 
part of the puzzle is demonstrating this and then the how to get this out to millions and millions of people is via social media um, I did a post two days ago it was shared like 60 times had 300 comments 300 likes um, that was one post I did several of them it's I believe this is the idea whose time has come because it's so simple and and one of our my favorite things to say is it's embarrassingly simple go plant a fruit tree and that fruit tree won't just pay you back like an annual does one time which is great annuals are we need annuals but perennials you plant them once and they can provide a yield for in, in the case of an olive tree over in the island of crete in greece two to three thousand years ago this olive tree was planted and it's still providing food for people so this is a little list of the um, fruit trees and medicinals and things that we're putting on our property, which we're developing right now. And I'm gonna um, kind of go a little bit through the list, some annuals in there, uh, mostly fruit trees and berry bushes. But this right here is a lot layout. And this one is being shared like crazy because when people see this, a lot of them think that it's complicated. They're like, oh my gosh, how much time does it take to manage that? Well, if you plant them right using permaculture principles, it creates a food forest. How much time do you manage the local forest? It's a silly question. You don't manage the forest. The forest manages itself. It's, net, it's a natural process. And the little bit about the details of this, when you plant, um, beneficial insect attractors with nitrogen fixers and chop and job and then the food systems all in one space then it it makes it thrive right you have all the components that are needed for a healthy a healthy forest but you're designing it to serve humans as well right so this is the vision that i have for the future um i am my, my team and I, we're going to go huge into social media. Dan and I are talking, love everything about what Dan is doing, the funnels. And I believe we're going to be working together in a lot of different ways to get this vision out. And then multiple versions of the vision. And I heard, like, what all you are saying has a piece of this because um, systems. And I, I love what uh, Stephen said. This, when you said 30 to 1, first of all, I love that personally. Um, when, and then when you said voluntary, I was hooked, <laughs> right? And, uh, and then um, Robert talking about uh, supply chains. Um, your documents, by the way, are phenomenal. Um, I would like to talk to you about how to make a better document because I know what I'm good at and I also know what I'm bad at. I don't know how to make those documents, but I do know how to get the message out and to communicate the message effectively. I'm on social media every day doing either live videos or, or educational videos, planting trees and talking about how easy it is, asking provocative and thought-provoking you know, thought questions. Um, so I'm very happy to be with you all. I have a pretty simple plan. Now it does involve, we've spent a quarter million dollars getting the franchise component ready and putting some of the pieces in place. So we are ready to franchise globally and it's kind of like plugging in Airbnb or um, what's a Airbnb or Uber, right? You use what's existing instead of creating something new. And so the existing network is called the permaculture network. There's millions of people all over the world who already do this. So what we are going to become is their sales and marketing agent. Um, and we're going to then take a commission. I love ecopreneurship. We're going to take a commission for providing them a customer. And by the way, that network is already a, like, they love this model um, from the top down. They love this idea of yes, marketing is valuable. That's part of eco. That's part of permaculture. So we'll provide some, um, we'll be happy to provide a commission. So we're going to plug in that way. We're also going to educate people to be, we need more permaculture designers because this solves all of the biggest problems of the world on the physical level health from the individual to the society wellness can be solved by decentralizing food water energy money medicine and education um, and i'm not saying that decentralized stuff is bad i'm saying that 
when you decentralize, you create the diversity. And that is the foundation of strength of any community, any culture, and nature. Love it, Jim. I'm looking forward to helping you. Um, connecting. Maya's made a comment. She might have some contacts that have already uh, got some things out there um, um, awesome. for you to network with. And yeah, let's make this all happen. Um, great work, Jim. Um, uh, thank you. So we'll, we'll have some backwards and forwards with everyone again shortly. But from when I was looking at all this, um, you know, it looks very simple and it looks like it can manage itself. But I saw a connection with Bob Sharon to provide some input with IOT for testing out the soil and water dam pond levels and um, how that applies to like sort of the smart city. So it's a sort of dovetail into how they can work independently, but we're starting to, you know, talk about, you know, community development, building cities like my own Ken had in the background where it's got to be on that scale and on that level. So we're going to be going through a bit more of that. Maya, you might want to provide some stuff on Reginibus later as well. Um, but Bob, if you can sort of connect what you feel is appropriate for the conversation and touch on at the end of your conversation, you know, lead us into the smart and sustainable property development discussion we'll be having next as well. Over to you, Bob Sharon, if you're talking, you might be on mute. I am. <laughs> I'm on mute now. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, uh... How are you enjoying it, Bob? Yeah, it's great. Um... Uh, listening to a lot of people, it relates to my studies of Mr. Sangi, Peter Sangi, who wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline. And he talks of things uh, around uh, a systems thinking approach, where you do something here, it will affect something there, wherever there is. So you may cut across your own ecosystem and into other ecosystems. And there's a relationship between those ecosystems, uh, for want of a better term. And uh, I, I, find, uh, I find that uh, this is what we're talking about on one level, but then on top of that, you've got the character level. <laughs> so you've got the physical things that are done. So um, in terms of sustainability, in terms of the things we're talking about, but I also love the character uh, component because that's a big part of what we do. In fact, uh, you'll all love to know we have a highly discriminatory hiring policy at Blue IoT. Highly discriminatory. And that is, if you haven't got a sense of humour, you can't work for us. It, it, is, it is fundamental policy for us. All right? If you can't have fun with what you're doing, what is the point? You know, like um, I, I, I post on LinkedIn on my profile, I uh, quote from Steve Jobs. Um, and when I saw the movie, um, and we're getting to the end. I, I had tears coming out of my eyes because it was, you know, when he was talking about we are the crazy ones, we're the square pegs in the round holes, and uh, you know, we're the misfits. I was thinking, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that fits me. I'm one of them. <laughs> I got retrenched three times in the corporate sector uh, because I call a spade a spade. They they don't like it, even though you know performance was through the roof. So uh, I call, well, I like to put it, I call a shovel a spade. Um, so uh, that's kind of where I come from. So I, I fit that description. So yes, it is about character. I like to quote um, Guan Chi, uh, if you're all familiar, or Guan Xi as the Chinese like to pronounce it. Um, uh, most Westerners think of this as the network, but it is much more fundamental than the network. It is the honor system. And the honor system is you shake on what you say and you deliver on what you say so you know let your yes be yes you promise something deliver it uh in the old days in china if you didn't deliver on your word you were outcast you were you're out of the network you were finished and so in a, in a modern day it's it's like okay you promise something and you honor your word and you deliver it so um, i'm a big fan of of, of character and so, you know, uh, in terms of culture uh, in our company, it's about, you know, the right, the right ethic, the right people um, and the right outcome. So, you know, it's about being focused on not selling a, a widget or, you know, yeah, I've got this fancy looking thing. So what, what can it do? How is it going to help? How are we going to deliver something that means something, not some 
you know, in, in, in building sustainability, there's everybody can go in and say, I'll save you 10% of, of money or energy or something. I mean, anyone can do that. But what about making a significant impact? What about making a disruptive impact and a difference? That's fundamental. So, um, so that's kind of where, where I'm coming from. And what I'll do is I'll share my screen. Uh, where are we? I'll go there. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, Can mate. See? Yep. Good. Excellent. All right. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, by the way. I'm just going to go through a, a couple of uh, uh, a few of the uh, a few of the slides uh, quickly go through. But I will share this this video though. Uh, now. Can you hear the sound? Yeah, the mate. music. Yep. Uh, not really the music. It's quite. No. Okay. Uh, I'm. I'm not going to bother then. Without the music, you don't get the effect. I don't know why. There's something with this. I'm going to have to look at this because without the music, you don't get a quarter of the effect. Right. Well, we'll. we'll um, I was just saying in the chat, we'll have a. Maybe you can share that video afterwards because I'm going to follow up with an email for everyone to connect everyone and. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll look forward to seeing that. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. So let me just get out of this. Uh, get out of that. Um, just a couple of quick things um, in, in recognition, because a lot of people like to speak and in, in all kinds of areas. I'm sure you've all come across people that said, oh, you know, we can do this, we can do that. And, you know, um, they're, they're blowing their trumpets, uh, but they don't really achieve a whole lot or haven't. So all, all I want to say is that we have received industry recognition for our disruptive technology. Um, last year, we won the IoT Pioneer Award from Next Media. So they publish a number of IT publications and IoT publications. And then last November, we took out the Facilities Management Association, FM Industry Award for Excellence in Industry Innovation. That was huge. Um, I even had to borrow a bow tie from one of my staff for the gala dinner. Not used to those things. Um, so uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty amazing. So now we're up for a global award. We'll see what happens uh, with that. But um, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, let me just get out of that. Don't need that. So uh, our technologies being control monitoring um, systems uh, basically covers virtually everything in a city whether it's a shopping center, an office building, a park, a river, um, uh, drains, uh, whatever the case may be. Of course, agriculture we spoke about. Um, from an agricultural point of view, we can lay wireless sensors in the soil to work out the salinity and the moisture in the soil and automate irrigation, for example, check the air quality, the water quality, operate the pumps, and even do predictive maintenance on the pumps with our vibration sensors and uh, monitoring the power quality of those devices uh, and everything else as we do with traditional HVAC systems. Um, and being wireless, of course, you haven't got nearly the same costs and, and our system runs a long range network. So uh, we can go in line of sight 10 kilometers or six miles uh, in US vernacular um, in terms of distance from our sensors to gateways, which are redundant. I come from a data center background um, and I judge them globally just for fun because I'm weird. I don't get paid for it. Um, but uh, we run a redundant network of gateways and redundant telcos for backhaul. We can even go direct to satellite if you're in remote locations to send data back to, uh, to our platform. Uh, we're agnostic, so we have our own cloud, but we can go back through um, Azure. We're now talking to AWS. Uh, so we'll work with what platforms people want to work with at the end of the day. Um, I don't want to get too technical, um, but basically that's a bit of the architecture. So I guess I'm drilling into far more into greater nuts and bolts perhaps than has been the case thus far in this discussion. Uh, but basically we can uh, put a whole bunch of sensors together, whether we're measuring, for example, air quality, mold, dust, particulates. Uh, we even have an organization in the US where we can measure bacteria. Uh, or certain types of bacteria, including golden staph and even bio threats, certain bio threats. Um, but just getting to lux levels, that is light levels, uh, the conditions in offices, in places, 
Um, and so we go to safety, well-being, wellness, uh, much better environment, uh, right through to your actual operating environments, uh, temperature, humidity, CO2, even in a meeting room. Have you ever been in a meeting where you've got 10 of you in a room and after an hour you're getting tired and sleepy and you're going, I get tired. Um, that's because your CO2 levels are going above a thousand parts per million. Um, and what happens is you, you know, you're, you're starting to get sleepy. It's a standard byproduct. So again, we can control systems to uh, minimize such things and make sure that doesn't happen. So we're not only controlling HVAC uh, systems for temperature, but we're running CO2 in car parks, CO, NO, uh, and a bunch of other things. And then we can go into a whole bunch of other uh, areas of uh, predictive maintenance. And all, most of these sensors are wireless, even powerless. So they run on a, a little battery that might go five years. And we've just invented new sensors. And by the way, LoRaWAN is our choice, a long range wide area network. Um, it runs on the 915 megahertz band or 923 megahertz in Australia, US, very similar. Um, and uh, the idea there, it's on a free band and it's uh, low, low frequency, long range. And it just means we can run our sensors and our sensors that we've developed are rules based. It means in the holy grail of IoT, we're talking about longevity of the battery life of the sensor. So we don't have to run power in a wall to it. So we can fit the sensor anywhere we like or mm. in the ground, in the soil, in, in, a, in a farm. Um, so what we can now do is tell the sensor how and when to send data to our platform. Might only be on certain thresholds. If, uh, if the moisture in the soil gets to a certain level, then send us data. Otherwise, just, just send us data a couple of times a day. So we're saving battery. Might get 10 years life out of it, for oh, example. Sorry, yes. mate, just while we're on this, Kent, do you want to unmute yourself, mate, and just tell us a little bit with that connection with asymmetrics that you were oh, sure. involved with? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it pretty pretty quick, but um, this is fascinating, uh, Robert. I we've, we've not met before today, but uh, definitely we'll have some things to talk about. <clears throat> One of the organizations I've been working with for several years that came out of my work uh, at Singularity University I gave a talk one day on uh, 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 big data, data science, data operations, uh, was an organization called Asymmetrics. And it, it, here is, um, uh, this is the web, web page, oh, and their oh, mission, um, uh, their, pardon? Uh, we can't see your screen, probably, Bob. Hold on, yep, just a minute. Oh, because Bob's sharing, yeah. Whoops, sorry, let me just <laughs> escape. I've been, I've been screen share bombed. <laughs> there, hold on, let me, uh, let me work out now how I unshare. Just a second. Uh, stop share. There we go. Okay, there I am. Yeah, so um, this is a website uh, for an organization called Asymmetrics. It was born out of some work that started for me with a, a gentleman that I met at uh, Singularity University. I'm kind of like their uh, CTO in residence, I guess you'd say, or chief data officer in residence. But anyway, their mission is to transform data into protein. And uh, it comes from a company, it's a sub of a company called Premex, uh, which is, uh, has the overall mission to nourish human wellness. And we use sensors to do that. There's, um, uh, see, I, I see this over here. Uh, this is one example uh, that we made for what's called Smart Farm. This is a, an AI camera that mounts high up in a bin uh, where there are pigs below. And it takes these kinds of pictures and these pictures get labeled. Uh, and then we build algorithms uh, that are capable of estimating uh, the weight of the pig within about uh, five kilos. And that's good enough uh, at large scale over time. And if you've ever tried to weigh a pig, it is zero fun. The pig doesn't like it, you won't like it. No, no, no. This is way better. <laughs> so we do that with pigs and that allows us to do fun things. And I was uh, entertained earlier listening to, to Maya talk about Aini. We have uh, named the AI Aini uh, that we use to, yeah, to coordinate and send messages and things back based on what's going on. And that's an example that a pig farm might get about the growth of their animals. And then we have another one that we built uh, a scale here and the scale is smart at the edge. And this is what you were talking about, Robert. The scale is very, uh, it's capable of weighing like 11 chickens at a time at all points of their life cycle and then aggregating all that data across all the chickens, just doing what chickens do as they grow. Um, and, and then feeding that into really smart 
uh, algorithms that are uh, uh, predictive algorithms, artificial intelligence, if you wish, uh, uh, to also produce alerts and guidance for the farm. And these things can impact your productivity as much as 20%, and that's a big deal in a, in a thin yeah. margin business. So yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, no, you that's know, right. I'd love, uh, love uh, to connect you and Jim as well with powerful uh, stuff. Other, yeah, that'd be fantastic. We're going to chat about that because that's something we can bring to farms in this country. And well, and, and we're doing... Places. And, yeah, and I want to have that conversation with you because I, I just realized immediately that there's a mesh there for us because we are expanding in the U.S. and some of the challenges uh, are very different from the ones that we've experienced in Latin America and India. So uh, we should definitely have that conversation. Mm. We should Thank you so much, guys. Um, well, uh, the largest uh, chicken um, supplier across Gasly. New Zealand. So let's connect. Oh, great. Yeah, well, I'm easy to find. Just can't uh, can't So. Yeah reach out beautiful awesome and um so we won't have the video for the next speaker uh we've got audio only with sam yang from australia csiro um his specialty is actually you know 3d printing and durability testing with a software system is actually created for metal i'm interested in talking to him about because of that epiphany i had first with technology with the ai with generative uh, designs and blockchain and you know, the 3D printing of jewelry, but then taking this to the next level with, you know, where to all get together and build a massive city and have all this cool architecture and be able to manufacture things online in a format of that nature, then how do we make sure that that stuff's gonna be durable, it's gonna last? Uh, Sam's doing that, putting, you know, for uh, medical parts and putting, you know, into spaceships. Um, so, and there's just quickly a really interesting lady we're gonna have on that next uh, interview that we're doing, which is talking about, you know, manufacturing in, in Mars to, 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 <laughs> to build on Mars. So it's gonna be crazy. But um, Sam Yang, you, you're still there, mate. You might be on, you there? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm still here. Can you hear? Beautiful, yeah. yeah good. Uh, oh, thanks for joining, Sam. Okay, um, just a few words about me. Uh, my name's Sam Yang and uh, I'm from, uh, uh, Australia, Melbourne, Australia, and uh, I'm a principal research scientist with a CSIRO. CSIRO stands for Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization, and uh, arguably this is uh, the largest uh, R&D organization in the South uh, South uh, Hemisphere, and uh, CSIRO do virtually every R&D discipline except weapons and the nucleus, so cover everything. And uh, uh, to narrow it down, we have a called a manufacturing business unit under CSIRO, and uh, further uh, further uh, focused on uh, we have a metal industry program, and uh, the metal industry program is for powder to product. Basically, turn metal powder into metal product. And that essentially, that's 3D printing. 3D printing is also called additive manufacturing. So it is a process uh, that build anything you want to manufacture layer by layer. And uh, in contrast to the more the traditional way of manufacturing, we do subtractive manufacturing, such as if you want to make a metal part or what other material, you get the, a bulk material, then you machine it down, remove the things you don't, you don't need, and create a lot of waste, of course, in that process, and uh, leave the things that you, you need behind. So apart from waste, it has a limitation about what the shape you can, uh, you can make because uh, you need to get the tools to, to process it or cut it. But in 3D printing or additive manufacturing, since we build layer by layer, we only build what is needed. So there's a minimum material waste. So in that way, then the intent, in the sense of the sustainability um, from the beginning and has a very minimum waste. Of course, uh, I see all the other, all other speakers have been talking about sustainability in a larger scale. So 3D printing or additive manufacturing 
is actually sustainable from the component level or from the uh, micro level. And uh, further for about me, my uh, technical background is more in a data, data rich and data constraint modeling and uh, applied uh, complex science. And um, the uh, in a training is more in a statistical physics. That's great, Sam. And one of the things I was interested to know was, you know, talking about uh, industrial hemp and its use in sort of construction. We'll talk more about this, but we're leading into, you know, tail end of this conversation. And Michael and, you know, I just uh, got off the phone a few days ago to um, Apis Corp, you know, looking at how to 3D print homes. You know, it's one of my missions to help um, with the sort of revenue sharing model to help fund, you know, shelter and build communities. So. How, how does that, what you're doing, apply to industrial hemp? Uh, the, uh, at the moment, the, our focus, since uh, the uh, additive manufacturing is a relatively new and emerging technology, so uh, the initial impact is more in a higher value adding and higher value and higher value adding uh, the uh, industry. So that's in you know, a space, aerospace and a medical uh, this other, but as the, as the technology matures, it will uh, the uh, uh, span uh, broaden its application to the uh, to the uh, more the day to day applications of the consumer product, and uh, also at the larger scale. For the moment, it is uh, more in a smaller scale, but the technology we develop is uh, equally applicable. To larger scales, such as uh, um, in a in a uh, architecture industry, um, maybe I can share a screen about what is the overview of. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Is it possible? Uh, yeah, there should uh, be just the uh, uh, share screen and share. If I maximize this, do you see that this is uh, the? Uh, um, yep. The thinking, underlying thinking, um, and we, I, yeah. if you yeah. if you look at uh, this are the the, uh, the current uh, standard uh, status. This is uh, one of the powder fit um, the additive manufacturing uh, process, machine and the process. Wow, it's good. Wow. So essentially, this is a machine. It get the metal metal powder. You get the laser, and you get the layer by layer. You build up uh, the thing uh, you like, and uh, um, so in this way, um, the what you build can be there's no complexity constraint. Um, so um, you can optimize the design if. Uh, and this is a very, it is related to the AI. In, in fact, added, uh, subtractively manufactured component of the machine can only be limited in its complexity because you need to be machinable. But if you build this way, it can be any shape. And uh, so you kind of have use on artificial intelligence to design any complexity and make it so to maximize the performance. Love that, and maybe just touch on your DCM, and we'll we'll talk. We might do a little mini masterclass or go into um, more detail with the property development on this sort of things. Yeah, I really saw that opportunity with you know the way that we can manufacture and um, consumer goods, and sort of I the way that I envisage everyone is that there we can have this e-commerce platform which is producing custom-made consumer goods, and we're revenue sharing to support you know, the movement and what we're building here, that's what's going on in my mind to help fund entrepreneurs into, I see a lot of opportunities to make money with manufacturing, long story short, plus with the property development I have an interest in. So that's where Sam fits in. You might want to touch on your data constraint modeling just quickly, and then that will um, touch on, then we're going to lead into Mike and we'll be wrapping it up. Sorry guys, I think we've gone a little bit over time. Um, obviously being very interesting and what have you, but we are a little bit over time. So Sam, if you want to wrap up and then we'll go to Mike. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, when you make uh, the high value, um, uh, the component, 
and we need to make sure that the quality is good. And uh, the, to, to check the quality, traditionally, we use a destructive testing. Basically, if you want to see the water inside, you cut it open. And, but at the same time, you destroy the things you want to test. That is, uh, that is okay with the traditional product line type of uh, manufacturing uh, production. You just sample, take some of them out. But for high value adding, for additive manufacturing, very often each component is unique. If you do the test, you don't have the component. So there's a defeat the purpose. So our focus is in a non-destructive testing. And uh, that is non-destructive testing, people use X-ray, but it has a limitations in terms of uh, resolution and the size. And so we have developed a uh, uh, DCM or data constraint modeling technology that is uh, uh, on top of the current X-ray technology and we can uh, do the non-destructive testing without destruction and also get a quant uh, quantitative uh, the 3D representation. And uh, this 3D representation can also be the food for further AI um, uh, modeling. So if you want to get it to, to see how what you meant that the component perform, and uh, this is uh, actually the digital food for the further AI development. I guess. Uh, yeah, I think that's great, Sam. We'll, we'll uh, talk more about uh, all of that and um, on the property one. Thank you so much for your contribution. And it's last but not least, I put Michael uh, at the tail end of this, Michael McElliott from the Smart Green Group. You might need to stop your screen share there, Sam. And um, yeah, Michael, look, really interested to hear more about uh, the low carbon circular solutions for urban environments that you're doing and how that connects to the conversation we're having and um, even the whatever you're able to uh, provide in terms of what you're working on with the alternate uh, funding solutions as, you've, as we've talked about on the phone, Mike. So over to you, mate. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, really interesting listening to everything that uh, everyone's uh, working on at the moment. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Jim. Jim has actually understated the, uh, the importance of permaculture and its scope for the rest of us and sustainability. Permaculture is the the permaculture design principles, uh, the way that you're going to get your Star Trek world, it's the way that we're going to be able to develop for the future. And it's, it's imperative that we, that we use that lens. Um, also with the sustainable development goals, uh, Maya touched on it. And um, I noticed you did talk more about the regenerative side uh, as opposed to development, Maya. And um, I understand where you're coming from with that on, on a very linear way in the sense of um, our, all our models of business in the world is, is geared on GDP and growth and production. And, and we have a finite world that we seem to base our economies into growing into. And, and there's going to be some roadblocks on the way. But if you change the concept of development into a way of rather than growth, developing depth, um, we can produce and keep creating and developing assets, especially infrastructure around the world that will um, become more sustainable with time because sustainability is an evolution of understanding and uh, it's a framework of, of how we're going to move forward. So with even, even with the large infrastructure projects and things like this, that, um, that we're going to need to put a lot more thought into as the world gets a lot tougher with climate change, the, the new will metabolize the old. And uh, when we have better recycling and, and waste management and circular systems for, for our economies, um, there'll be a natural progression of where we get depth out of, out of, out of it and offer a linear model of growth. Um, we got, uh, in the next 10 years, we got 8.5 billion people projected to be in the world. So it's a, it's a large jump. Um, and the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement heading towards 2030 are really focusing on keeping our um, global warming down. There's really two main issues that we have on the planet and one's global warming and the other is everything else. And we need to stay focused on that. So everything we've been talking about with uh, consumption, production, development, 
everything needs to be through this lens. So to take it back to a sustainable business and sustainable investment as well, uh, the, there's three sort of models of both and the sustainable business 1.0 is basically do no harm. So profits come first, uh, but then we're also thinking about environmental and social concerns. Uh, sustainable business and investment uh, 2.0 is to do with, that's your triple um, net bottom line where you're thinking in a totalitative uh, combination of profits and um, environmental and social outcomes as a whole. And then most of the world is actually between one and two there in both sustainable finance and business in that sector where uh, sustainable finance and business 3.0 is to do with um, number one is this, the, the stakeholders value, what, what you can do with the community, how you can develop it and, and how you can do the greater good. And as long as the profits are coming along at the back of that and the business is sustainable, then everything's all right. So I wanted to think in terms of, um, with that backdrop with, um, the Industrial Revolution 4.0. So we're moving into a data-driven and connected world. And the problem with that is that everything is accelerating quickly. So all our negative aspects of everything that we're developing and producing is creating more waste, creating more um, efficiency at doing the wrong thing. So we have to really have a reduction lens on how we move forward. So before we scale, we have to think about how we minimize um, just to just to make a real world example of of something um, i was talking to actually bob the other day in regards to his sensors and his iot so in the next 30 years two-thirds of our population are going to be in urban environments in our cities so we need to really plan now because uh, 30 years is nothing nothing at all especially when you're developing especially in regards to infrastructure so if a city say i'm, I'm sydney based so say sydney said, look, we know that um, autom uh, autonomous vehicles are coming in. We want IoT sensors everywhere. We want to maximize the efficiencies of things because we know from uh, the projections that um, autonomous vehicles and EV and everything is going to actually create more traffic. So the first knee jerk reaction uh, at a city level they'll make is, all right, efficiency, efficiency. We've got more stuff, we need to make it efficient. Um, and, and Bob could move in and be contracted to deck the whole city out, all the traffic systems out with um, his sensors and create algorithms and machine learning on, on, on creating that whole system efficiently. What they would inadvertently be doing is creating more pollution, more traffic, more noise, more, um, more waste into a system before thinking about the reduction lens on it. So from a sustainable business point of view and the mindset that we, we walk into a situation with is, all right, well, with the goal in mind of, of reducing carbon footprint on the planet and, and everything has a carbon footprint, every dollar has a carbon footprint, um, how, how could we look at this? So I might walk in with Bob to the, the council and say, look guys, we're actually, we run this program on efficiency, but what we can also do is we could have a look at what what streets aren't actually needed anymore. So where all the cities are, uh, have grown organically, um, natural waste of infrastructure are sort of built into the city as you evolve. And we might find old service lanes and things like that in the street that aren't actually um, really used that much or not really valuable. And maybe you do a few traffic changes and a few moderations in a city through his, through his algorithms you could really demonstrate to the council, well, you know, this whole street isn't really needed as a street anymore. Our whole economy is now with Amazon and with online shopping, means that our retail areas and our inner city environments are, are moving towards um, a service provider environment. So a lot less products, a lot, lot less um, deliveries needed. So we might say, okay, well, well, let's think about changing this street into an actual pedestrian area. And, and let's think about the businesses or the buildings in this area being actually open and zoned so they could actually have more pedestrian traffic, maybe restaurants, entertainment areas. And we could develop that in a sense where we're creating a more livable intercity and, um, and more profitable for the local councils because they'd be able to get more 
rents and, and, and fees and, and all the rest of it from business. What I then uh, do is go and talk to all the stakeholders, all the building owners in the street up and down and, and explain the, the situation that, look, the street's going to pedestrianise. Why don't we consolidate all these buildings? Why don't we think about what we can really bring a value and culture to this area, what's really needed? So um, I think in property development is you're always looking at um, what's the best purpose, fit for purpose for this, this development, this building. So we might look at a mixed-use development, might have affordable housing up on top, it might have um, you know, uh, commercial units down the bottom and that would fit the area, whatever that would, um, the research shows. So with that, now we have um, a joint venture between owners. Uh, we have uh, a sustainable building model that we can create. Now, next week we're gonna talk, or next month we'll talk about um, the property market more. We can talk with Bob again in, in terms of um, BIM modeling and, and how we design out waste and everything out of our systems. Um, but as a group, we've got this joint venture, we've got um, stakeholders, we could talk to Jim about uh, designing uh, green infrastructure for this area, which not only, you know, food forests and things like this, sometimes it's not, maybe it might be a vertical garden up the wall, but um, that could be used as a buffer and a hedger against the pollution that's coming in. So we've reduced the street uh, pollution, the street noise, we've created more living environments, more entertainment, more culture and, and um, a, a green infrastructure hedge on, on pollution. And, um, and, and that's how we could, as a group, like straight away, I would be thinking, um, we talked about the hemp industry with you guys, you might um, have clients that are producing sort of a hemp-based um, semi-permeable tile because the old street will have like, will have a nice garden area or, or pedestrian walk, walkway. That's a massive capture for, for water and, and rainwater. So rather than having um, us overloading our intercity stormwater um, systems, the semi-permeable uh, tiles could, you know, act as a soak away for half of this. So we're, we're engaging on a more regenerative, uh, low carbon sort of uh, building material as well. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about um, the packaging and everything. Maybe it's a restaurant or some sort of service area that we can start talking about, you know, other hemp, particularly um, uh, the hemp plastics, you know, biodegradable plastics. And we can really start to cut down on this ridiculous amount of, of microplastic that's littering our world. Yeah, I think there's an interesting conversation between the pros and cons. I know there's a, a you know, portion of people that are concerned about privacy with sensors and you know everyone moving into cities and stuff so it's probably more uh, now a conversation for the next panel I look forward to having that and thanks heaps uh, Mike for your contribution um, and Kent probably will I will we'll connect again in regards to who, who wants to contribute and be part of that smart city property development I think nearly everyone here um, yeah, Robert Palmer's got his hands up. I'm going to go on a gallery view, um, pretty much to just open the floor up. I, I've been really, I've already been impressed with everyone that's contributed beforehand with the independent conversations, but to come together and uh, also want to open up the invitation that you know, um, some of you have seen some communication from me, but we're launching the XO Masterminds as part of Unified Purpose to basically connect all these consultants or anyone that's in the knowledge business, you know, getting paid for their knowledge and skills to the innovation and the, the mindset that they need to you know, be tapped into for them to be able to have a sustainable business, even if they're just working independently as a consultant. So I uh, would love for all of you to be involved with a monthly discussion offline. Some we might go online again like this, but um, everyone here in the previous contributors and there's some, some people that fit into this that aren't on this call, that will be the same. Um, so I'm looking forward to connecting you all together. But if we just open up the floor, you just want to sort of put your hand up if there's any more contributions or whether we go around in, a, in an order, uh, which we started, might be a good idea if, there, if you just want to say, you know, final thoughts, probably starting back to yourself, Kent, we'll go back in the order and then open floor with any questions. Uh I'll be super brief. I, I think you've put together an extraordinary group of people here, Dan. Thank you uh, for having me as a part of it. I, I have things I want to talk with everybody, every single person on this panel with. Uh, I would love to hear more from the attendees that are out there if they have questions. 
uh, at all about anything they've heard or uh, obviously we just need to there was a lot of resources shared here so we need to get those all, all typed up and uh, and shared out as well but no I, I i don't have anything else to say than that other than that. thanks to all the panelists and uh, amazing uh, incredible work all of us are doing i just it's a pleasure to be a part of it i'm really honored and if you could help with all with cutting up bits of the content connecting the old kent you know let's let's have a chat about that um, of course yeah yeah uh, who are we off to? Who are we, who's next? Raphael. Yeah, brilliant. Um, thank you. Thank you all these amazing panelists, uh, Dan, putting this together. Um, yes, I, I, well, you know me, Dan, I, I can talk forever <laughs> uh, sharing. So I'm, I'm not going to add anything specifically except to just say that um, it's, it's our awareness and understanding that gives us the consciousness to grow. And we've been doing things uh, uh, with a mindset that's, well, it's been going on. It's been running continuously since the last ice age, if not before. So we've got these old operating systems here and our amazing thinking, feeling biocomputer brain bodies. And uh, there's a lot to be said about creating the mindset, creating the mind that allows us to, to thrive. And you can, uh, because uh, the way that I tested it is that um, I intentionally put myself to zero. My partner and I intentionally put ourselves to, to zero to see what we can do from nothing just if we started with a thriving mindset and we were able to go from zero to multiple seven Daddy. figures very quickly. Daddy. So um, we all have what we need. We're all born with everything we need to thrive. We just gotta, we just gotta kick into that gear and we can only figure it out by looking inside and feeling it. So um, yeah. I'm excited to uh, connect with everyone here because you all have such amazing projects that together we can all use to make the world a better place for us and for, for other lives. So brilliant, well done, thank you all. Thanks man, over to you Steve. Yeah, not a lot to add and at the same time, so much to add. It's a um, really inspiring group of people. It's nice to be surrounded by progressive thinkers that are well balanced between technology and harmony with our planet and people. So yeah, just I just want to connect with people. There's a lot of things I want to be able to promote. I mean, we're, we're about to work with the largest chicken uh, distributor in Australia. So I'd love to share that technology and we're connected to a, a lot of property developers that are passionate about permaculture, but they don't have the knowledge. Um, yeah, there's just so many things in hemp. Like, it, it, it's just about collaborating, bringing it all together, and, and, and let's create a system. And EXO sounds like it's a, a great platform to do that, where we can do it with harmony and fairness so that everyone has the opportunity to live their purpose and thrive together. Love it. Yeah, well, um, there's so much to talk about in there. Um, over to you, Maya. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. You, you definitely brought in the amazing group of people and just uh it it every time i'm in the conversation like this i i'm like well you know the star trek timeline shows up i was like we've got this uh if we've got such amazing people working on so many things and um yeah i definitely been connected to so much of as a conversation went deeper and deeper i was like yeah i've done some work here i know some people here i think we're all so connected that continuously that continuing the conversation is something that with every, each and every one of you is something I'd like to do because there's we, we barely have scratched the surface but I think that's a, a, a really a great um, a great thing that to show that the amount and the quality of people here will lead to probably more deeper conversation and uh, and more collaboration so I'm really excited about that and really want to be thankful to you and everybody on this call today thanks Maya awesome um, Robbie, Palmer. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Man, it's been, it's been amazing. Uh, I just want to echo what a lot of people have been saying. I think it's imperative that we all uh, follow up with each other and you know share our resources. Uh, first, by stating like, what we need, and then we can share with each other, and we can kind of see who can fill those gaps. I think it's a good starting point. And yeah, I look forward to collaborating. I, I definitely see we all have the tools here. We can we can do this. We definitely can do this. I'm excited. Awesome, man. Awesome, uh, Jim. <laughs> I see an absolutely amazing future. We are in the midst of the greatest awakening, I believe, of humanity. And I think the future is gonna be incredible. I think it's gonna be one hell of a bumpy ride. I think we're at war and in a really subtle and wicked way. But I think that we focus on solutions, which all of you have, all of us have, then we're gonna see, my grandkids are gonna, are gonna grow up in paradise. Yeah. And I need you. Like, I, I know where my strengths are. I know where my weaknesses are. And as a team, we can crush this. Thank you. Love it, Jim. Great work, Mike. 
Who was next? Who we got? Sorry. Uh, Robert, Bob, Sharon. Yes, uh, it was great uh, hearing you all. And um, uh, people here tend to have a bit of passion, which, um, of course, um, I love. Um, in other words, you know, everyone cares. And um, I really enjoyed uh, this whole thing, the amount of information, uh, the people, the, the collaborative effort that could be undertaken uh, will be great. Um, from our perspective, uh, even all our systems are open API, which means we can collaborate even from a systemic point of view. Uh, we don't believe in proprietariness. We believe in open platform uh, in everything we do. So, um, you know, there's a lot we can talk about. We're looking to f work with partners around the globe um, and, and share the disruption together and uh, help it grow and make a real difference. So, you know, we're all winners together. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. Right, beautiful. Um, Sam Yang. Yeah, so this is really, really great. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dan, for organizing this uh, conversation, and uh, I really enjoy it. Um, and I uh, hear the uh, both uh, the very broad scope and also very focused uh, topic. Um, and uh, the uh, I was really thinking as a uh, the collaboration is a way to go. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, back to you, Mike, and then I'll sum up, we'll finish up. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm very big on networking, so anyone feel free to reach out anytime. I'm, um, I'm very hands-on in business, so if you're willing to, to get your hands dirty and, and get into sustainability, reach out to me. We'll get something done. Cheers. Right. Look forward. I'll follow up, uh, work with you all individually, compile a bit of a follow-up email for ourselves and also the attendees. And where I want to finish up is just by saying, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, through different relationships and conversations we've had, uh, I think this has flowed the way I wanted it to flow. There's obviously a lot more conversations to be had, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you on, on different levels. Um, one of the things I want to put out there, I mean, Unified Purpose, the name should represent, you know, a lot that's synergistic to you guys. And when I was writing out business plans, I had like committees of, you know, contributors that will end up tying into revenue sharing type models. So I'm looking forward to pretty much asking questions. Kent, learning more about that tokenization model for contributors. Um, Steve, how do we apply the values and cultures to the mastermind groups and the teams that can get created like that? Going down the road of the property development, looking at that systems and, you know, ecosystems and, uh, how it all sort of connects together. So in your Fast Track Institute, Kent, so there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts, which is good. And that's the way I like to work with my crazy mind, connecting the top sort of things. So, but I don't have all the answers. So if anyone can, uh, well, let's, let, we'll organize uh, an offline, maybe discussion about the EXO masterminds and collaborations. And I was talking to Stephen about setting up Unified Purpose as a social enterprise and having sort of share um, employee schemes attached to contributors like yourself to earn a piece of unified purpose. Um, um, you do your own things, of course, but that's the model I'm rolling out in terms of, you know, rewarding contributors to this as well. So I don't have all those answers. Maybe Kent and Steve, we can talk about that uh, with what you've currently done and uh, Michael with the funding of different, you know, what you're talking about with that new financial uh, model and, and then we'll all come back and tie it all together. So. That's where my crazy mind is at. At the moment, I'm just laying the foundation with uh, the consultants with the sales funnels, the mastermind groups. You guys will be part of the first ones there. And I uh, look forward to, to working with you all. So thanks a lot for attending. Unless anyone had any questions before we hang up, appreciative of your time. I've gone a bit over. So <laughs> I had you in the background. So I can. All right, we all good? All right. Thank you, Cheers. everybody. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Really great Bye. to meet you all. Thank you. Great to Bye. meet you all. Bye. Bye-bye.